of the Beats. The Beat Talk for You Radio. Brother B.A. Ben Abraham, Yo. and I'm your host of the Man Up segment on the Big Talk for You platform. The objective is for all brothers from different walks of life to come together, link up, and build on matters concerning all various stages of life. If anyone would like to reach out on concepts and ideas, you can reach Brother B.A. at Radical Rhyme 1984 at gmail.com. Again, yeah, Radical Ryan, 1984 at gmail.com. Tap in. Let's build. Tap. Shalom. Shalom. Peace and greetings to you. This is Amuna Yisrael, affectionately known as the First Lady of the Bait Talk for you. I have enjoyed coming to you week after week, you know, season after season, growing together, speaking about the difficult topics, investing the energy, time, and effort with our brothers and sisters on the panel. Today, I would like to come to you with an opportunity for you to invest in something that I've been working on and that's near and dear to me. It's called the Yummy Cottage. You can learn more about it at www.gofundme.com backslash the Yummy Cottage. We're currently fundraising so that we can get it off the ground and your help would be appreciated. Once again, www.gofundme.com backslash the Yummy Cottage. Check the link in the box and hope to hear from you soon. Don't touch that dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. Hey, what's going on, everybody? How you guys doing? Welcome to another show. You're now listening to Season 8 of the Big Talk Free Radio. Of course, this is Sal Showtime. And this is the brand new segment called Fact Check. This is volume two right here on the Bay Talk Your Radio. We appreciate the family out there that's tuning in via phone or via Skype. I'll dial in at number 319-527-6239. Again, this is Fact Check. You know, no debates, no arguments, just the facts. That's the theme for this particular segment on the Bay Talk for You Fact Check. And today's show is entitled African Hebrews Revealed. Once again, African Hebrews Revealed. We have a lot of special guests that's joining us tonight right here on Debate Talk for You. But I have a special co-host that's joining me tonight right here on Debate Talk for You Radio. This is Only Love. Welcome to the show. Shalom, Brother Sal. Thank you so much for having me um, on this segment as I migrate over from Under the Palm. Hebrew Women Speak. I really appreciate it. All right, so for those who don't know who you are, just let them know about yourself. Good. Oh, yes. Um, my name is Only Love Chica Alston, and I'm the founder of Prophetic Worldwind, Uncovering the Black Biblical Destiny. And that is a research ministry that focuses primarily on um, African Hebrews, and, or Hebrews in Africa, rather, and on the woman's role according to Torah and the Torah's call to justice. And it was launched um, actually about four years ago out of um, work that I was being asked to do by um, actually people in the church. I'm from New York City, and I've been to Ghana, Togo, and Nigeria um, to do research, to build with the people. In, ni- in November, I was in Nigeria for about two weeks ministering to various Um, Hebrew congregations, but in particular, ministering to the various women in those congregations about who they are according to Torah. And I have a great passion for doing um, research on African Hebrews. My first full-length book, Prophetic World and Uncovering the Black Biblical Destiny, will be out in March of 2018. And in it, I profile about 15 ethnic groups that have Hebrew Origins from Africa, and that's being published by the Voices Project, the imprint of Colleen College, uh, um, ironically a Christian college, but they're allowing me to tell the full truth. That's the only way I would publish the book. And just um, really passionate about um, us knowing our Hebrew identity through our connection to Africa, us building across lines between Africa and the diaspora, Prophetic Whirlwind is actually based on the Marcus Garvey speech, Meet Me in the Whirlwind. 
where he's talking about who we are um, according to the Bible and just having a Pan-African view of our role as Hebrews and really connecting across tribes um, like the prophecy in Ezekiel talks about with the two sticks. So that's a little about me. I'm also a part of the Under the Palm Hebrew Women Speak um, panel that's, um, that happens twice a month where Hebrew women gather to talk about different issues and really appreciate you, Sal, um, for just providing this opportunity and really also standing um, behind your sisters and the Iman so that our voices are heard as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate you. You know, Sister Only Love does a lot of work in the community, uh, and we appreciate everything that she does and provides for the platform as well. Once again, it's my co-host for the night right here on the Bay Toffee Radio. All right, so let's introduce the special guest. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll give you the honors, you know, being that you put this yeah. all together, African Hebrews Revealed. You can go ahead and uh, introduce everybody. Yes, and um, so would it be okay if I just give some context about why we were doing this particular fact check? Yes, sure. Before mm-hmm. introducing the guest? Okay. So um, some of you might be thinking about the title, Why African Hebrews Revealed. What is an African Hebrew? What is a Hebrew living in Africa? Well, this particular fact check came up because um, many of us are now starting to realize that we can prove our Hebrew identity through various um, what is called lost tribe communities in Africa, especially in West Africa. And understanding Hebrews in Africa is critical to understanding and proving your Hebrew identity. Israel has been separated from Africa, not only for us mentally, but literally and physically when the Suez Canal was completed on November 17, 1869. This literally caused the land of Israel to be cut off from the African continent for commerce. The Suez Canal was built just for commerce. So are we using our Hebrew identity to run from blackness? Are we using our Hebrew identity to run from our African heritage, our dark skin, our broad noses, our woolly hair? Are we trying to separate ourselves from Africa because we may be ashamed? When you look at history and even when you look at the Bible, the story of Israel is always um, entwined with running back and forth into Africa. The destinies are very entwined. Um, This show came to be after observing some attacks on certain Hebrew tribes in Africa. But also, um, a few months ago, um, Debate Talk for You had some shows called The African Hebrew Controversy, and I spoke to my brother Sal and said, you know, well, where's the voice of the sisters um, from the, you know, African Hebrew perspective? And so Sal um, said, well, we can – work with you on that, but also he put together a whole bi-monthly panel of Hebrew women to speak, so I want to celebrate him for that. But um, what, I could have um, done this panel alone, but I really wanted to feature different voices that have been studying African Hebrew knowledge for many, many years. Um, when we look at the prophecy from Zephaniah 3.10, we hear from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. Get out a map of Africa, look at Ethiopia, and then look at where beyond the rivers of Ethiopia are. When you do that, you will actually see that this prophecy is about my scattered people bringing y'all offerings from Central and Western Africa. The kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of the south of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi were separated thousands of years ago. And this separation is real and it's felt into this day. But in Genesis 49.10, we're told that Judah has the responsibility of gathering the people. But what happens when Judah doesn't know where to gather his people from, but his enemies do? I noticed in 2012 that many white Jewish organizations were dedicating a great deal of time, money, and resources to searching out lost tribe communities in Africa. And yet in America, we had Hebrews avoiding Africa like the plague. But yet Ezekiel 37 says that the two sticks must come back together before the dry bones can be revived. In my travels to Ghana, Togo, and Nigeria, I noticed a great deal of Hebrewisms in the culture, 
and a great desire to connect with those of us from the diaspora. But when I'm walking around New York, I hear preaching about Hamites. And yet Reverend Dr. Thomas Oden said, Africa has always been a refuge for the outcasts of Israel. Indeed, the destiny of Africa and the destiny of Israel is deeply connected. And so tonight we want to dispel some of the myths about Hebrews in Africa and get a greater understanding. And so with that, I just want to introduce some of the powerful panelists that we have here um, with us tonight, and some have been friends for a very long time. We have Ronald Dalton, author of Hebrews to Negroes, um, also a filmmaker and host of his own show that comes on weekly, Hebrews to Negroes. He is very um, versed in studying um, Hebrew tribes from various parts of Africa. We also have Brother Joshua Collins from Hebrew Nation Building. Um, and his partner, Morris, couldn't be here today, but them as a duel, they run assemblies, but also teach a great deal about um, African Hebrews. We have my fellow New York brother, Brother Yahoo, who um, studies under one of the most prolific um, African Hebrew authors and writers, the author of The Call to Hebrews. And Brother Yahoo has a very informative YouTube channel that focuses on the Yoruba and gives a great deal of knowledge. And then my personal friend and brother, Jarrell Livingston, a.k.a. Akan, who also studies under the author Malawi of Call to Hebrews, who for many years has been a thought partner with me and others around looking at the Evwe people who we will hear about tonight and knowing about the Evwe is key to understanding Hebrews in Africa. And so I wanted to just um, give each brother on the panel just a moment to just say anything you would like to say about yourself to the people. And um, we did um, attempt to ask some folks who were born and raised in Africa to be on the show, but due to scheduling, that was difficult to do. I also reached out to some sisters, but when you get into time zones and having to call from what's up back, it makes it a little difficult. But if you are a Hebrew brother or sister from Africa and you're listening, when we open up the phone lines, please talk. We want your voices to be heard. And so with that, I just want to turn it over to the panelists to just um, say something to the people about your work before we get started. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll go first, me, Brother Yahoo. Is that fine? Yes, that's great. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Sister. Um, I, I think uh, Sister Only Loves uh, said all that we needed to hear. Uh, it's very informative. Um, the things about my work is that it's not original, uh, as she was mentioning. That is actually an extension of Brother Maoli's work. And uh, what I do is I go back to the old history books, um, where, you know, all these uh, European people wrote about us. And, you know, in these times, you know, they didn't think that black people would ever, you know, be going back to these books and reading them. So I managed to go back to look at what they say, and I compare and contrast what the Africans are practicing today, our brothers and sisters, and, you know, I, that's what I build upon in, in my work. And, um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Thank you so much, brother. And where can the people find you on YouTube? Um, I go by the name uh, Ezel Gamesu. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a little funny because the um, character that I'm using is the Velan character of the Ezel language. So um, the way you could find me is usually uh, I, I have a, a set few videos, um, like, like the way I, to pronounce. I mean, the way to state it. I mean, it's kind of weird because the uh, nobody will really have that character to uh, actually look me up. So, I mean, if you type in the name Gamesu, that's G-A-M-E-S-U, you'll probably, you'll probably be able to look me up that way on YouTube. And um, so far, I mean, I don't have any social media platforms as of yet, but um, I'm looking into it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Brother Yahoo. And we'll make sure no to problem. get those links in the um, description of uh, okay. when it, when the show comes up on YouTube, and I think Sal already has it up on the blog talk description. So thank you so much, okay. brother, representing Haiti. Right, no problem. Thank and you. So you're welcome. And so can we have um, the next panelist introduce himself? 
Yes. Um, um, can you guys hear me? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Is that Jarrell? Yeah, this is me, uh, Brother Jarrell uh, Livingston, a.k.a. Akeon, uh Gadeesh from offline. Um, hey, sis, how you doing? <laughs> I'm good. Um, how are you, Big I'm I'm okay. Um, I'm doing good. I'm I'm um I'm glad and humbled to be a part of this panel. And um, just to fill you in, um, I've been studying African Hebrew history for uh, maybe um a good fifteen years now, maybe more. And um, I'm ever learning my research and the knowledge I gain from my research. It's constantly um, evolving and changing, and it really evolved when I uh, met Brother Molly. And um, the thing is, is that um, uh, what what I have been given is is also an extension of what he has uh, taught in his books and things that he has also taught me as well. So um, I'm just glad to be here. I'm also here to learn as well. So. That's that, that's a, that's that's it for me. Thank you so much, and he's representing Upstate New York. And when we refer to Brother Mali, he is from the LA people, royalty of that tribe, but has really done some of the most innovative research I've seen about African Hebrews in a while. His books are The Call to the Hebrews, and the Bible is the Black Man's History book. And um, his website is actually on the flyer for this show connected to Brother Jarrell and Yahoo's account. Um, account. And so I'm going to go to my brother, um, Josh, Joshua, from Hebrew Nation Building. You want to say anything to the people? Hey, shalom, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Joshua Collins with Rebirth of a Nation, which is also called Hebrew Nation Building. Um, me and Morris, Basically, the type of work that we do is we um, we help build assemblies and we try to educate our people about who we are. We um, our slogan that goes um, uh, we uh, rebuild, repair, and prepare. Well, I said it wrong, but in essence, that's what it is: <laughs> restore and repair. Um, so what we try to do is bring people back to the to the knowledge of who we are, um, and try to educate them on topics like we talk about today. Uh, we some people know us from the documentaries we did when we um, battled the Christian apologists um, that calls himself uh, Reform Apologetics. Um, so anyway, but it's, it's, I just want to say that this is this topic is a very important topic because even going back to uh, the the video we did um, in debunking the apologists, in order for us to prove uh, a lot of these claims that we're talking about, we have uh, the the Hebrews in the areas that we're talking about in West and South and Central Africa, um, even parts of North Africa, um, are extremely important for us to be able to identify them um, when it comes to proving who we are, because that gives validity to the things that we say. So we we um, point out these traditions and um, some of the um, writings, like the brother that, with the book, and like I'm like him. Um, uh, I'm here um, discussing and learning from from all of you because everybody that's on this panel um, are extremely thorough and um, gifted in the roles and the most high engagement as far as trying to educate the people in, um, about this culture that's been stolen from us. Uh, but but yeah, so um, just getting back to that point, that's it, it's very it's imperative um, that we have these conversations and um, and discuss that and, and bring this information out that that's really been hidden from us because once we do that, like um, only love bring out at the beginning of this uh, conversation. We're able to do a bunch of things. One, we're able to um, unite as a people because we're showing that connection that was lost. Um, and uh, two, um, going back to my latter point that I made a minute ago, it just it, it, it just gives more validity to the things that we're saying um, because it gives more of a structure of a, um, of a culture that um, that's more rooted than most people think because we. we you have a conversation with people and you just give them Deuteronomy 28. A lot of times it's not going to be enough to, to convince some people, <laughs> um, especially mm. people that are on the track. Mm-hmm. So, um, so anyway, I, I can be long-winded, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let everybody else speak. You know, uh, it's an it's a honor and a blessing to be uh, amongst um, everyone that's on this panel. Thank you so mm. much, Brother Josh, from Hebrew Nation Building, and we 
want to shout out your partner, Morris. Um, They're both examples of those leading assemblies who are in the truth and using this knowledge to teach, you know, their people um, that come to Shabbat service and Bible study. Um, And so we're going to just move on to Brother Ronald Dalton from Hebrews to Negroes author of multiple books and um, producer of multiple documentaries. Brother, can you just um, introduce yourself shortly to the people? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Ronald Dalton. Uh, the, the research I've done in my four books, basically, I mean, it, it covers Africa from all spans, from North Africa to South Africa to East Africa to West Africa. And it basically com- combines DNA and language, tradition and custom, uh, tooth records, blood types, everything to this, basically uh, prove who we are as a people, that we're not making this up, and that uh, the Bantu people in Africa have connections from uh, Israel, and they scattered into uh, Africa all over. And and from there, you have the Arab slave trade and the Tanzanian slave trade that scattered us all across the four corners. But, yeah, I, I cover a whole vast of things using multiple uh, uh, facts, a plethora of facts. Thank you so much, Brother Ron. And Ron is actually en route from teaching a a church this knowledge about who we are using these facts. And, yes, um, Deuteronomy 28 and those curses can wake up many people and are very poignant. Um, My family was owned by the largest slaveholding family in America, so when I read it, 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 it knocked me upside the head, but um, I have friends who grew up wealthy. Their parents were wealthy. Their grandparents were wealthy, black, American. And so Deuteronomy 28 is not going to be enough for them, though they may face some of the quote-unquote curses. They're going to more so need um, a deeper connection. And if our faith is strong, we can use history, current events, um, science to also um, – collaborate or corroborate what is in the word. And so with that, um, what we're going to do before we open it up for questions from the audience, because this is a fact check, and so we want to get out some of the facts, is that we're going to go around, and I'm going to just um, some questions of all the panelists, and each panelist will have about two minutes to answer the questions. And then um, I'll have some questions for particular panelists, and then we'll open it up for the audience to have questions and comments. Um, We want to keep it respectful and get your pens and paper because there'll be a lot of knowledge being shared. And brothers, if you're quoting from a particular book or article or video, um, you want to state that clearly for the people so they can can look that up as well. Because I know um, sometimes this is very hard to believe information, and so I know all of you come with sources as well. And so the first question is, why is it important for Hebrews in the diaspora to know about Hebrews in Africa? So why is it important for those of us in America and Haiti and Brazil to actually know about um, tribes in Africa with Hebrew ancestry? So with that, we'll start with Brother Yahoo. Okay. Um, why is it important? That's a good question. Well, um, We were all taken from Africa, so it's naturally that we have to go back to Africa to learn about our Hebrew ancestry because, you know, that's that's our motherland. That's where we came from. So um, I know us coming here to the Americas as, you know, slaves and all that, we all lost the identity, and we can't really, in a sense, find out what tribes we came from. But if we, you know, if we go back to, to Africa and we, you know, try to connect these people and you know, there's a way we could actually find our roots. You know, we, there's a way to actually connect back. Um, in particular, like uh, for, for my people, because I know I come from Haiti, I know that we are connected with the other people. Like uh, our roots, we go back to Dahomey and um, even my um, family history. Um, my father has, has the oral tradition stating that his family came from Dahomey, all of us. So we have most mm-hmm. of the uh, oral traditions particular also um i'll also i'll also mention the uh voodoo cult uh that many people seem to call black magic but you know it's not really black magic it's uh sabianism it's what um the hebrews were practicing when they left babylon 
and got, went into Egypt. And, you know, when they were expelled, I mean, it's one of the reasons why they were expelled out, out of Israel for the first place, because they were practicing the Sabianism. And the Sabianism is the tradition where the Hebrews, where they moved away from God and uh, went to the ways of divination and um, also to, uh, they started, you know, going towards the familiar spirits and, you know, you know, uh, trying to, you know, go to the familiar, to the familiar spirits instead to try to, you know, for, for whatever necessary needs, whether it be for health related issues or whether it be for, you know, anything pertaining to, to life, this is what they were practicing. And um, the Haitian people, you know, they kept these same traditions as well, even when they came from slave coast out of Netherlands. And so um, that's how, that's one way how I know we are related and how we could link ourselves back to the other. I know it's um, kind of unfortunate for many other um, African descended people in the Americas as well, because, you know, they, you know, over time, their history was kind of, you know, condensed and, you know, they forgot who they are, but, you know, there's, there's always a way to come back, but um, everything begins with Africa. That's how it is. Thank you, and I like that there's always a way to come back, like the prodigal son, which was actually a parable about, you know, the lost tribes. And the thing is, when you're looking um, for Hebrews in Africa, there are a lot of cultural practices that missionaries Mm -hmm. who are ignorant of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, Mm. they would see things like Mm -hmm. the pouring of a libation and say witchcraft. But actually, libations are drink offerings, and it it appears in the Bible 34 times. So it should only be done by a Levite and only to Yah. So for us, we've been taught to be afraid of practices that are actually pre-exilic temple worship. Um, You know, the temple in Jerusalem wasn't like, you know, our um, grandma's church. It was um, very ritualistic. And so that's something that if you are... I'm afraid of, you know, certain cultural practices. You're going to miss the Torah that's right in front of your face when you go to Africa. So, Brother Yahoo, right. thank you for that. No problem. And so, thank brother, you. Um, you're welcome. Brother Josh, why is it important for those of us in the diaspora to know about Hebrews in Africa? Um, I think it goes back to um, the bishop statement that I butchered, <laughs> which is really awaken, restore, prepare. we got to prepare for the next step. You know, um, you know, a lot of times in our assemblies we talk about um, either prophecies, we talk about the second exodus and um, uh, going to the wilderness again, and us coming back as a nation. So, um, in order for us to come back as a nation, like the brother said, we got to first know who we are. It's a, it's a brother that um, that I worked with at the hospital for a minute, and when we first we did the first um, the first reform projects destroy um, documentary, I was trying to get it to him. He's from Cameroon. Now the crazy thing was. Um, you know, me growing up in South Carolina, which, you know, has, has zero connection to any of our roots besides just basic cultural practices. I was thinking that he would have a lot more um, information. So I was kind of just, um, uh, you know, like, you know, kind of pride and trying to figure out, you know, um, what he know. And, you know, I was trying to have these conversations with him to try to draw some information from him. And one of the things that he told me was the um, majority of the history they had was taken by the colonialists. So I was like, man, so you mean to tell me even – in the like even in Africa, we got some of our people that that t- the culture has been taken away from them, and it, just, it was kind of it was an eye opener for me, um, and it just showed me how how strong this conspiracy is um, to keep us in desolation. Um, so um, so saying that to say, uh, as, as t- to me, it's that twofold thing. So one is um, it's restoring us back um, by um, preparing our minds and. Um, it's, you know, it's a prophecy about, um, you know, scripture talk about Elijah and him turning the hearts of the um, mm-hmm. sons, father and sons, um, reuniting that. Well, it's crazy because um, it's a movie coming out pretty soon. <laughs> and this, this guy, it's got nothing to do with what we're talking about, but it's a movie called Black Panther. And just in that movie, a movie that's talking about Africa, um, we see people uniting around it. We start to come back. Why? Because the colonialists had this mindset mm-hmm. to try to do mm-hmm. everything they can to separate us from identifying ourselves with those people. Mm. You know, if we went back to our culture, we went back to our roots, we will find out what they've done to us and how, to, you know, again, in the, in the limits of this cover-up. Um, so, uh, so anyway, it just, it's just kind of interesting, um, uh, um, especially for me. Um, the ironic thing is, um, shout-out to Chad. That's actually my cousin <laughs> from, from my mm. hometown. 
So, um, <laughs> um, but, but saying all that to say, these things are extremely important. If if we don't um, rebuild those bridges that's been that's been burned, and if we can't shake the colonial mm. mind of um, the hatred of our past and, and this whole mindset of of, of, of um, uh, our West Africans being our enemies, because that's really what they, they bred that into our minds. So we got to shake that off if we're gonna um, build them, become a, be- a family again, and build those ties that's been um, uh, that's been torn. So that's my take on it. Thank Thank you, brother, and I agree with most of what you said, but i got to correct you on one thing. So you're from <laughs> South Carolina, where most of the um, brothers and sisters are Gullah Geechee, and I have the honor of interviewing the queen mother of the Gullah Geechee for Sojourners Magazine. And actually, the Gullah Geechee have kept a lot of the um, African cultural practices, Hebrew cultural practices, and many um, blacks from South Carolina have that ancestry, and they they come from countries where a lot of the Hebrew of way people were from. So I definitely think there's the connection in South Carolina. And one quick fact about Black Panther is the army of women warriors um, um, that Lupita and the other sisters play with the bald heads, they are actually based on real-life Dahomean women Amazons that were mm. fighters who would sometimes keep Sabbath and not eat pork. They were celibate while they were serving. And so I just want to tell y'all brothers, you know, we know Dahomey is a place of many Hebrew Urbway people. So, you know, the sisters were, were <laughs> fighting the battles in Israel, like Dayel and, and Dahomey. So don't sleep on us. But with that, I'm going to head to um, my brother Jarrell um, to just answer that question. Why is it important? For us to, in the diaspora to know about Hebrews in Africa. Well, um, I, I like what uh, Brother Ronald Dalton had to say, and um, what Brother Yehu had to say, and shout out to Joshua Collins too. Um, one of the reasons uh, that is it is important for African Hebrews here in America to know um, why it's important to know that there are African Hebrews in Africa is because, first of all, when it comes to uh, the Hebrews in Africa, they are made up of tribes, clans, and families. The tribes are made up of clusters of clans, and the clans are made up of clusters of families. So the thing is, the the main uh, fiber and structure of the whole well, mainly we can talk about Hebrews in Africa and other people is the family and the blood yeah. connection. You see, so what we can do? What, why is it important? Because we can apply what they're doing over there, and we can take what they're doing over there and apply it over here. You see, and what it what it what it's going to do is cause our black men to step up and be the heads because of the the family, the clans, and the tribes have family heads over them, and their functional, responsible family heads over the family, the clans, and the tribe. So what black men need to do over here is be functional and responsible as family heads over here, and then we can progress to, um, you know, clans and tribes, but we have to rebuild the family, the Hebrew family, and really and build it the real. You know, it's based on our history, our culture, and our identity. But another thing is also, um, you know, they have establishment over there. They have established. Um, they have establishment based on us coming out of kingdoms and empires. We weren't just a bunch of Hebrews just scattered without any organization. Mm-hmm. We wasn't just over there, you know, as Africans not doing it. No, we had organized governments and empires and kingdoms, whether you're talking about the kingdom of Songhai, whether you want to talk yeah. about the kingdom yeah. city-state of Alada, whether you want the, the kingdom city-state of Oyo or Yori. Um, we had, you know, we, had, we were very organized, you know what I'm saying? And uh, one more thing. Um, you know, we have kingdom, we have kings, priests, princes over there. Political, mm-hmm. the, the, um, theocratical heads. 
these are things to look to because we saw the pol- um, politicians over here all of the time. And we look to uh-huh. But the thing is, we, we have people over there, real tools, real, real places and places that we can look to, you understand. So, and dudes, as we progress along, we can apply some of those things over here. But, um, you know, to answer that question, yes, that's the reason why we as African Hebrews who are really blood connected to those people over there need to look to them and get what we need from them. Yes, thank you, brother. And the family head system can be found in Exodus when Moses was about to lose his mind and his um, father-in-law Jethro said, you need to appoint family heads, some over 10, some yeah. over 100, some over 1,000, so that you don't lose your mind. I think sometimes in America we're looking for this one Hebrew teacher to lead everyone, but that's not actually biblical. And as a community organizer, I'm very passionate about, you know, those, those systems of organizing our families in our community, because what will we do if social media ended tomorrow? How will we communicate? So that's very great. And Brother Ronald Dalton, do you want to answer that question, why it's important for those of us in the diaspora <laughs> to know about Hebrews in Africa? Oh, yeah, it is so important. Uh, first first and foremost, it, it really it irritates me when I watch documentaries by the Jews and they and they have searching for the for the lost tribes and they go everywhere except for Africa. And they do go to Africa and they talk about the Ethiopian Jews and may they, they sometimes they really don't even cover the Lemma Jews that much. But uh the, the matter of the fact is that when you look at the Bible, the majority of the Hebrew Israelites started early on as a nation from mixing with the with the with the sons of Ham in, in Egypt and Cush and Canaan and even before you know, they had the, the King Saul when the Israelites were fighting each other, when they were battling with the Philistines and battling with the Canaanites, and they were marrying with them and, and whatnot. You know, they were all mixing with the sons of Ham. And, and it's no surprise that in the Bible, the Israelites were constantly back and forth into Egypt. They, you know, Joseph, well, Joseph, uh, his brothers were coming back and forth to, to, to Egypt when there was a famine. So you can't ignore Africa when you talk about the Hebrew Israelites, because honestly, there's probably way more Israelites in any other part of the world uh, in, in Africa than anywhere, anywhere else. If you really, if you really boil mm-hmm. down to, it, because the, the Bantu people, mm-hmm. when you really, when you really break down the DNA of the different peoples in Africa, when you go from like the Kikuyu to the Kisi to the Kamba to Sakuma to the Chuwa to the Yao to the Mandingo, the Soninke, the the Serer, the Wolof, the the Yoruba, Ten name. I mean, you can just listen to them on and on. How you can just keep naming off different Bantu tribes, but nobody really knows that they're Bantu because you know they just see black people. Um, but when you look mm-hmm. at, when you break down their language, you break down their traditions and customs. When you hear some of the stuff that their elders talk about, uh, you see that it's Hebrew Israelites all up in their lineage. And um, you know, we just have to uh, basically wake up black people. Uh, the, the the diaspora, the, those that are scattered through the slave trades, and then also uh, those in Africa. Once they start realizing this truth, man, it's going to be a monumental awakening of God's chosen people, mm-hmm. and 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 it's going to be just a connection from all over, from the UK to the Caribbean, to the United States to Africa. Yes, that that's true. And you know, if you are supposed to be gathering and looking for someone, and you're looking in the totally opposite direction. But then again, your enemies are actually looking in the correct place. Who's going to be being Judah who's gathering? Um, I've seen multiple documentaries and film festivals about, you know, Hebrews in Africa, but told through the eyes of a white Jewish person. And so we'll be talking about a documentary that some of us are working on to tell our own story. Because when you look at, if you read about many Hebrews in Africa, they're going to be called African Jews. And we know the issue with the term Jew, but these people are being named by outsiders. They're not naming themselves. And so in a little while, Brother Yahoo and Jarrell are going to talk about the importance of the name, Erwe, um, because we have to make sure we name ourselves. So Brother Ron already jumped to the next question. <laughs> so thank you, brother. <laughs> but um, I'm going to head oh, back over to Brother Yahoo. What are some of the groups in Africa that have Hebrew origins? Okay. Um, well, there's the um, Moshe people in uh, Burkina Faso. 
they have the uh, Tengan cult. The Tengan cult is uh, basically they build an altar of earth where they propitiate the spirits in their own traditional, um, um, in their own traditional uh, spirituality, as I may say. Uh, what they do, uh, they go to these spirits to, uh, um, you know, seek help or advice um, based on, you know, uh, community health. Uh, usually what it has to do is because the whole work is divination. So what they do is uh, they'll have clients come to them and, you know, the, the uh, priests, they go to the spirits to get an answer. They go back to the clients and they tell them, okay, this is what must be done. Um, you know, this is what they have to do if, you know, if certain, you know, if X, Y, Z does, you know, uh, then we have the uh, Dagaba people who are an extension of the um, Moshe people out in Burkina Faso that they broke away from a long time ago. They have a cult, um, or rather a tradition called the Bagre uh, myth. And um, mm. actually there was an anthropologist named Jack Goody, uh, like probably 30 to 40 years ago. Uh, he, he lived among these people and recorded all their traditions. Mm. And the Bagre myth was, had an uncanny resemblance to the biblical story of, of Genesis uh, it mm-hmm. speaks about two people, man and woman, how they disobeyed God and they were driven out. And uh, the man, because of his disobedience, he had to um, farm. He had to, he had to work on the field, you know, like farm. And, you know, so it, it would yield fruit. Um, instead, when he, was in the, when he was in the place of God, he didn't have to do all this work. And um, mm-hmm. actually the tool, the farming tool, is this, is, um, it symbolizes um, his disobedience. Uh, towards towards God, and mm. so um, other all other traditions they have um, they have a uh, political uh, traditions too because um, as I said Sabianism it was uh, was divination and you know intermixed with uh, Levitical customs so you know they had uh, one custom they had was to um, you know uh, I guess let me see if I if I remember correctly there were some customs based on um oh yeah the sabbath uh, the seventh the seventh day where they say where they state that on that day they consider the sabbath no work is to be done and if um if anyone is, is to do any work on the on the field it's a taboo and that they must um they must propitiate you know the land by you know sacrificing a goat or fowl you know to appease the anger of of the spirits i mean this this is all sabianism as i said and, um, I mean, those are the only two tribes I want to reveal so far. Um, okay. You know, as, as you know, there's the other people as well, but I, wanna, I don't want to keep, you know, dragging it. Okay. Thank you so much for mentioning that. And one thing we have to understand is for the northern kingdom who, um, through the Assyrian uh-huh. captivity or sometimes just yeah. for trade or for different um, issues, they came Um, from Israel deeper into Africa because we know Israel was connected to Africa, but they went in before the Messiah came. And so you'll see a lot of the continuing of the sacrificial system because, Mm -hmm. you know, they may have not known that that was over. Now I don't know where people lie with messianic, non-messianic, but sometimes we see sacrifice and we're like, Oh, you know, automatically paganism, not knowing that some people may have been so isolated that, they continued mm-hmm. their Levitical practices, and then some of it was corrupted. And so I want to just um, ask you another question, Brother Yahoo. You mentioned yes. divination. That's in the Torah. That's a no-no. So, so what's going on there? Well, um, you see, because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, when uh, the uh, Hebrews came out of Babylonian captivity, they, they left with uh, these, uh, these rites. They left with divination. They left with, you know, as I mentioned, this is Sabianism as I'm mentioning. So when, uh, when they came back into Israel, they were expelled. If you look into uh, Jeremiah 44, if I remember correctly, they say mm-hmm. to the prophet, they say that they, they make the declaration that they will not stop pouring libation to the queen of heaven. Mm-hmm. Now, all, these, all of this mm-hmm. is connected. The libation pouring, the, uh, the, the, you know, the sacrificing animals to the spirits, all of that. The mommy walks because, up, yeah. uh-huh, Mommy <laughs> walks all of that. And, you know, what's interesting, in the Edo Kingdom, the Bini Empire, uh, they actually, uh, they have a god called Olokun. They called him the god of the sea. Uh, they also had another name for him. They called him Mamun, or Mamon, which meant the god of riches and the god of fame. This could be connected back to what they say about Mamun in the Bible, about uh, where I think the line says, you cannot worship 
God and you cannot worship Mamun at the same time. They made the uh, symbolism to meaning that this God was a God of money, a God of riches. But um, to, uh, to, not, to, not, to not digress, um, basically uh, when, they, when they made the declaration to uh, the prophet Jeremiah, they said they would not stop. And that's the last we see of them. They go, you know, into Egypt, and from there, um, you know, this is what they continued to uh, to do. This this became their tradition, and it became intermixed with the Levitical with the Levitical customs, um, just as in uh, Dahomey and you know Everland, and you know even in Haiti, you know Haiti had the the whole Voodoo cult. Uh, what the word Voodoo means is is gods or spirits, and what these priests are, they're all diviners. That's all they do. It's true that there's witchcraft embedded into this tradition, but it's actually separate because um, what they do, what, the, what these diviners do in the uh, Voodoo cult, they work for the community. So they go to the spirits, you know, if someone has uh, sickness uh, problems or, you know, if they want to find out something, they go to these diviners and, you know, the diviners help them. That's how, uh, you know, that's how they uh, get their clients. That's, that's what they do because it's part of the tradition. And these, all of these traditions to be linked to the to uh, the African people in West Africa and East Africa and you know wherever else they're scattered. Wherever you go in West Africa, they all have these same these same rights, these same traditions. Uh, but mm-hmm. you know, even though it, it's it, it's in different names and you know different words or whatever, it's all connected. These are all the same people. But you know they might have different taboos regarding you know what not to do, what to do. But it, it's all connected. This is uh, Sabianism. That's all it is term, you know, I, I repeat it many times, you know, it's not really known among, you know, our, our Hebrew brothers and sisters on the West because, you know, they don't really know about, uh, you know, any of this stuff or, you know, what it was really called. And the fact of the matter that Judaism, you know, is not really anything we should be getting into because Judaism is, is an ism, it's an ideology. It's a way, you know, it's what the Jewish people adopted from the tribe yeah. of Judah that they came in contact with. So, you know, why would the Hebrews want to, you know, why would they want to get into Judaism? I mean, our, you know, the, Levit- the Levitical ways that these people used, I mean, this was a way of life. That's the difference. This, is, this was mm-hmm. our way of life. What, mm-hmm. the, what Judaism seeks to do is copy our way of life and turn it into something completely different. But um, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll stop right there. Thank you. And, you know, that's an important distinction because what you will see is a lot of Jewish missionary groups going into Africa and pushing rabbinical Judaism. And we're in no way trying to uplift practices that Yah forbids, but we're just trying to tease through some of the cultural practices that show who the people are. If you read Numbers 527, it says if a woman was um, committing adultery, you know, take her Mm -hmm. to a Levite and she'll drink this concoction that will bring yep. those curses mm-hmm. and, you know, blow up her stomach right. to show if she cheated. That's very ritualistic. If we, if someone did that yeah. today, we would say, oh, witchcraft, but that was actually commanded in, yeah. in Torah. And so um, I want to exactly. go to um, um, my brother, I want to go to um, brother Ronald Dalton. You kind of named some groups already, but just again, for the people, what are some of the groups in Africa that have Hebrew origins? Uh, oh man, it's, a, it's so much. I just okay, nope. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not gonna be long with it. Uh, just well, a few. Well, when, when you look at, uh, say for instance, um, okay, I'm gonna start off with the the, the Zarma people. Uh, now a lot of people don't know about the Zarma people, but they they live in in Niger, and and they're a Bantu people that fled uh, Mali after the Songhai Empire. Uh, fell down, and and they know very well about Sonny Ali because Sonny Ali, uh, he was like you know one of the last Israelite so-called Israelite rulers uh, before not before uh, Askia Muhammad came on the scene and said no nope, we're all going to just do Islam and if you find any, any Hebrew Israelites out here practice, practicing you know the Torah you guys are going to be your goods are going to be confiscated we're going to kill you we're going to enslave blah 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 so these people over in Niger they have a lot of Hebrewisms, like you know, I was reading about them, and they and they circumcise on the eighth day, and they name on the eighth day. And I remember asking, uh, this is going to another child. I remember asking a, a lady from uh, Cameroon, and she said she was Duala. And I said, well, "What is your father?" And she says, "She says, well, my father was Bamaleke." 
And I said, what was your grandfather? She was like, Bamaleke. And I said, well, then you're Bamaleke, but it's okay. So then she said, um, I asked her, what day do you circumcise? And she she looked at me and she says, oh, I don't know, because she's a Catholic. And I said, well, just this, this thing. And she said, the eighth day. And I said, why the eighth day? And she says, that's our tradition. That's always been our tradition. And another girl from another girl from Cameroon walked down the hall, and she and she asked her the same thing. She said, is it the eighth day? She said, yes, the eighth day. And so you got tribes like the Bamaleke, you have the the, the, the Zama, you have the, the Kikuyu. The Kikuyu people, or Gikuyu, uh, the founder of the Kikuyu people, they they say that they came from the north. And even people from, from like, uh, the Sukuma tribe in in, in, uh, in Tanzania, they say they came from the north. You have some where from the north. They say, you say Ethiopia, they say, no, 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 further north. You say Sudan, Egypt, they say north. And I say, what? And they say, Israel is north. <laughs> so they say, yes. And so then when you read about the Kikuyu people, the word Kikuyu basically means sycamore or sycamore fig. And so the story is that the Kikuyu people come from the land where the fig tree grows wild and free. And there's hmm. the fig trees all throughout Israel. It's like different, there's more species of, of the fig tree in Israel than any, any other place in the world. And we all know in the Bible, Yeshua also, also talked about the fig tree in the parable. And so it's not a coincidence that the, the, the Kikuyu people, they hold Mount Kenya to be sacred. It's like the place of, of like where God dwells. Uh, they call him the guy, N-G-A-I. And the Kikuyu people... Hmm also have a lot of Hebrew traditions and customs that they that they keep. Even the, their cousins like the Kisi and the Kamba, like you ask them, oh, uh, what kind of what, what kind of food can you guys eat? And they say, well, we can't eat the duck. We can't eat the donkey. We can't eat the horse. We don't we don't eat the pig. And he said, why why don't eat why don't eat all the stuff? He said it's forbidden. It's, it's, it's not it's what we don't do. And so they have a lot of Hebrewisms, and and that's just like on that part of the of, of the side of Africa. But then when you go over to Say uh, West Africa, where there's most a lot of Islam, and especially in Senegal, Gambia area, you when you really do the research about the Mandingo, the Sonike, the Sarakale, they call them different names back in those days, uh, people, you will find out that the people that really know their history, they say that they came from the land between two rivers. They came in the area of Mesopotamia, uh, Israel, and they left during the Babylonian siege, and so. When they came over, and eventually made their way over to uh, West Africa. Of course, when Islam came, it kind of mixed up things with their culture and their language. So now, when you ask any Mandingo or Wolof person, how do you say the name God? They're going to say Allah. But when you ask them to, can you write down your original script, the original alphabet? They can't do it because it's like a lost thing now. But I showed this Mandingo slash Wolof guy from Senegal. I showed him. What the Jewish people had in their libraries, in their in their locked up over there in the museums, libraries. I showed them. I said, "This is the ancient Sonique script, dating back to the time before the Spanish Inquisition." And I showed them the, the Sonique ancient script, and I showed him Aramaic at the time in in in, in that time period in Iberia before with the Black Jews, the Black Moors ruled in Spain and Portugal. And I showed him Arabic, and I asked him, "Which one of these languages does your ancient language look most most familiar to?" And he said, "Aramaic." I even took the Sunni ancient script to an Arabic person that, that spoke and wrote Arabic and a Chaldean person that knew Aramaic. And I asked her, which one of these, which one of these languages? I basically showed the Sunni. I said, does this look like your language? The Arabic person said, no, it doesn't like my language. The person that spoke Aramaic, which the Chaldeans, they're, they're from Syria, whatever, Iraq, they speak Aramaic. They said it looks like Aramaic, but I, but I can't really understand, can't really decipher everything that that is said in there. And I said, well, this is from Africa, it's from West Africa, and her mouth dropped. So there's even though you have Islam in a lot of places and animism and uh, uh, like like uh, the brother was saying with secret societies and voodoo and people uh, worshiping snakes and and doing all types of things that the Europeans call fetishism, where they said that the West African tribes were really like into pagan idolatry worship, like it's crazy. Um, even before all of that, it was Hebrew Israelites that they were practicing the Torah. Uh, they were practicing the, the lashes of somebody got in trouble. Thirty nine lashes, say one. It was uh, there was the new moon celebration, uh, sacrificing for sins. Whether you had a chicken or a goat, uh, you know, these, all these things were were in different tribes from West Africa to East Africa to uh, Central Africa with the Congo and the Cameroonians. Uh, if you, if you, can, if you can go into South Africa. I'm not going yes. to the South Africa yeah. people. 
Thank you so much, Brother Ron, um, for giving that overview. I just want to turn back to Brother Sal to make a quick announcement. Are you there, Sal? All right, family. Once again, you're now listening to Fact Check, Volume 2, African Hebrews Revealed. The number to call in is 319-527-6239. If you have any questions or comments, simply dial that number and press number one. However, we're going to wait till the 9.30 p.m. hour uh, time before we open up the phone line to the audience out there. So what I'm going to do, of course, when that time comes, we're going to go down the line in order and take some of your questions. Again, that number is 319-527-6239. You can call in via phone, call in via Skype. And again, uh, you can press number one now because I'm pretty sure there's going to be some questions out there. And uh, when we get to 930, we're going to open up the phone lines. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Sal. And so, um, Brother Jarrell, I want to go over to you. Um, I think we've heard a lot about the cultural practices that can show you where the Hebrews are in Africa. I think we've heard a lot of different tribe names being, um, you know, thrown out there. But I wanted to ask you one thing. I wanted to ask you in particular, why does it seem to be this aversion to Africa among the Hebrews? Why do we see a lot of, oh, it's only Hamites and um, people wanting to actually use the Hebrew identity to distance themselves? from anything black or African? Why do you think that is? Well, some of it is self-hatred. Just plain and simple self-hatred. A lot of it is wrong doctrine. And and we've come into learning what a Hebrew is thinking that racially they're the other, and they're not. You see, ethnically they're different. You know, when you're dealing with these uh, ancient Hebrews, even in, in the Word of God, the Hebrews were a set apart people, but they were racially the same, just like everybody else. Whether you're talking about the Egyptians, whether you're talking about the Ethiopians, as a matter of fact, if you um, if people reference uh, Herodotus in his book called The History, he says that. When it's been talking about the Egyptians, he says they are burnt skin, woolly hair, broad nose, and thick lips. Now, the thing is, within the word of God, you have different ancient peoples who confuse the Hebrews with the Egyptians four different times in Scripture. Whether you're talking about whether um, Joseph's brothers couldn't recognize him when they walked down into Egypt, okay? Whether you're talking about the daughters of Midian who mistake Moses for an Egyptian, or whether you're talking about the Romans who mistake, in the New Testament, mistake Paul for an Egyptian, okay, Um, or whether you're talking about when Jacob had died and they went to go bury uh, Joseph and his brethren, the Egyptians went to go bury um, Jacob in, uh, in the land of Canaan. The Canaanites thought all of them were Egyptians, but they wasn't. There were Hebrews with the Egyptians mourning over Jacob, you see. So the Bible says, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Those four, those four instances right there, it's established, you understand. So there's no, uh, there's no getting out of the Hebrews being Africans, and plus on top of that, we cannot, no one can say that the Hebrews are not uh, Africans, because first of all, as a nation, they were birthed in Africa, okay? They were birthed in Africa. They were created as a nation in Africa, and uh, they were there as slaves for 400 years. Not only that, mm-hmm. the, first, the first generation of um of males that were born from the, uh, the family of 70 that, that traveled down into Egypt, who, who were their wives? Was their black African Egyptian women? Not only that, but also to add to that, that the, um, the Hebrews already had their own black African identity and pedigree before they were, you know, before they multiplied in, uh, in Egypt. You know, um, also, um, when when dealing with this, they would get uh, in history. They were always being mixed up, uh, being um, uh, they were always being mixed up with being um, 
with Ethiopians in history. If you read um, Herodotus, if you're dealing with um, uh, Eusebius, Eusebius, he, he um, excuse me, he got, he got them confused. He described them as Ethiopians, but he said they, that they, were, uh, they came from the Indus River, but they really came from the Tigris Euphrates River. So the thing is, in history, they have always gotten mixed up with being African or African looking. So, and then on top of that, them being in, them running down into Egypt from Israel, and they've been there for 3,000 years. You understand? Mm-hmm. So, there's no getting out of that. You know? Yeah. Thank you so much. And so, what Brother Jarrell is bringing out is the difference between race and ethnicity. So, you know, the the Hebrew people are another kind of branch or tribe of the overall so-called African or black people. We can say when these terms were made, a white man made the terms or whatever, but sometimes we need to discern in our own spirits if we're trying to get away from, you know, um, things we feel ashamed of by all the, you know, these different Terms. And so thank you, Brother Jarrell. Some of the common practices we've heard that are Hebraic in origin that you'll see in Africa are libations, um, Sabbath being a sacred day that's been, um, in, you know, gone away before missionaries, um, you know, the, the Levitical sacrifices, um, the having actual priests and, and Levites. And one good book to read about the history of the Sabbath in Africa way before missionaries was Sabbath Roots, the African Connection by Charles E. Bradford. That's a great book. And so I wanted to just go back to Brother Josh from Hebrew Nation Building, and I wanted to ask you as someone who's leading kind of a flock of people spiritually um, as, you know, an elder over an assembly, how does understanding Hebrews in Africa help you understand biblical prophecy? <clears throat> Because there isn't any biblical prophecies that don't point back to Africa concerning Israel. Um, again, um, like the brother said, going all the way back to the birth of the nation coming out of um, out of Mizraim, right? Um, you can go further down as far as we talk about in the diaspora, which we started off this whole. Um, you start off the whole conversation talking about Zephaniah three, which says beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, what I call the that we use. We say disperse, but that's the term we use for that for diaspora. <clears throat> that's the term that the so-called Jewish people use to this day to identify themselves with. But if you we you, you read that, of course we know that it was, when the scripture says um, the other side of. I mean, what it's saying um, the other side of the word Eber means the other side of the river or the rivers of Ethiopia. And again, you pointed out that earlier. That's um, those areas in northeast, west, and south Africa. I mean, north, south, and west Africa. Um, and even though Hebrews are scattered all over the continent of Africa, um, we can go back to um, to like the, um, so I bring up Jeremiah in the times of the Babylonian captivity when um, when Nebuchadnezzar was coming against Israel. You already had um, a bruise who were ready to leave and try to <laughs> try to go out and try to escape the captivity. Um, we can talk about the relationship um, that um, Egypt had with um, with Israel uh, during that time frame because we know that the we know about the time of the Exodus, but when you read on down, you start finding out the two of these intermarriages, and we know that the, the marriage of a king and um, and another king's daughter, it, or, or um, uh, you know, is a is a bond between kingdoms. So we start seeing when you um, these whole relationships. If you talk, listen to the Falashes, and they give the whole story about Melan, uh, Melanie and um, um, uh, Mechada and, um, and King David and all these other things. So um, when we see around the time of, that, of, of, of Nebuchadnezzar, what happens? You start hearing about these, um, like uh, at one point in time, even Egypt coming to the aid of Israel <laughs> during that time period. So you, again, all these other nations. Somebody talked about how um, you talking about the Midianites and their relationships with, the, uh, with Israel. We know that Ethiopians. Matter of fact, even the Most High compares Israel to, to the Ethiopians. Um, you know, in the scriptures. Uh, <clears throat> We can see we can go to the Brihadasha, we can go to the New Testament when we um when the um, book of Acts where we talks about um Shavuot or Pentecost. When it's feast day come and where they coming from. The scripture talk about um, how they coming from the four corners of the earth to the high holy days. And where do we see them coming from? Libya. Uh, right? We see them coming from um, um uh Niger, right? We know about Barnabas, um and um Simeon being in the congregation at that time. So we see that even at that time they was embedded in these areas. 
So, um, and what we do is a lot of times we take quotes from um, history, um, from explorers and all that, because that tie back into that into that same place. I mean, for, for instance, it's a um, Jewish professor, Professor Dr. Alfred Bonheimer, and one of his quotes is that British rabbis were already aware in the 1840s that they might be descendants of the Ten Tribes in the Niger Delta. And this this is our current. This dude is still alive. So um, you got Jewish professors even admitting that they knew that um, around the Niger Delta there was um, there was Hebrews uh, or Ebony people in that in those in those lands, which would correspond mm-hmm. to what we see in Zephyr um, yeah. and, this is, and it you know, and there's another quote from them even um, speaking on how they knew about that before the Fall of Shah. So you know they had this whole operation um, Israel where they where they um, took flight took planes over there to bring the Fall of Shah over there, but according to their own historians, they knew about they knew that we was in West Africa at that point in time. So, um, um, and then one of the um, biggest things we're looking at, even um, we quote the, the scripture with Zephaniah 3, um, but there's another scripture that, that course, corresponds to that. It says, woe to the land that's beyond the rivers of Ethiopia with shadowing wings that's going out to a mm-hmm. people that is what? Adder, mm-hmm. meet it, mm-hmm. meet it, and try it down. Right? Mm-hmm. So the people are coming to this place to where? Enslave these people. So all this keeps keep mm-hmm. going to these provinces and leading us back to these areas in, um, in Africa. Where um where uh, the Israelites were were so if you're trying to go like I said when you're looking at these prophecies you're trying to identify um um Israel you're gonna to have to go back to um mm-hmm. go after, you have to go back to Africa because it's it's um right. it's central in identifying who the people are. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, and um that is um it's two prophecies to keep in mind: Zephaniah three ten, Isaiah. 1111 to verse 12 and you know many of the Jewish people know you know where we are if you look online you can find an organization called the International Society for the Study of African Jewelry where most of the these are academic people with doctorates at some of the best universities in the world only about two black people on this academic board but they dedicate their careers to studying, um, you know, our people in Africa. And so why aren't we doing the same? So thank you so much, Brother Josh. I just wanted to move on to um, just another question that I would like everyone um, to speak on. And um, we can start with Brother Yahoo. But um, and this may be a controversial question, but as a day talk for you, we don't <laughs> run from controversy. But why is the twelve tribes chart dangerous for teaching and understanding our Hebrew identity? Mm. We're going to go to Brother Yahoo first. Uh, <laughs> how do I answer? Why did I give you that one first? <laughs> oh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. I mean, the twelve tribes chart is dangerous because. I mean, you you can't really you can't really apply you can't really apply the twelve tribes to you know a set of people out in the Western Hemisphere if you don't know their origins you don't know their roots you know it's mm. it's like you're just giving them something you know you're just giving them an identity but they don't have no proof no foundation to stand on so <laughs> it it makes it look foolish so um, it, it it also you know it's also the wrong way to teach our people. Because um, it also moves them away from Africa, and um, mm. I, I've seen what they do with the with this chart. You know, they they try to it's like they they cause a divide. You know, they um they uh, they separate the Western Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere, and then you know they say, okay, we're we're on this side, everyone else is on that side, and you know they try to list you know, all these groups. You know, you you don't know where they got the information from, but you know all of a sudden it's biblical, and you know to, according to them, and you know this okay. this is what it is, but it's a dangerous thing to, to be, you know, teaching our people this because it's it, also in a way it's fooling our people, you know, and we're, we're all just trying to learn. We're all just trying to find that link back to, to Jacob. And, you know, we don't begin with, with something as foolish as a 12 tribe chart. That's not really giving us the answers, but it's just causing us to move further and further away from the truth that we're, that we're seeking. Thank you so much. And um, we're going to just, um, move on to Brother Ron, and if we can keep the responses and up to about a minute, because there's some individual right. questions I want to get into before we open the line. So, Brother Ron, in a minute, why is the Twelve Tribes chart dangerous? Uh, well, because you can't limit uh, the Twelve Tribes of Israel to just one location, because 
And Isaiah talks about the children of Israel being gathered from Hamath and from Paphros and from Cush and from Assyria and from Elam and from Shinar and Sinem. And if you you know if you, you, you do the research of these areas, including Sinem, you'll see the different places that Isaiah is talking about. But even further, uh, you know, the Bible says the children should be scattered to the four corners. So we have to keep in mind that you had the Assyrian invasion, the Babylonian invasion, you had the Greeks, you had the Romans, you had all these different stages of time where Israelites were were exiled or captured, and they, and they started scattering different places. Uh, and so, therefore, we we can't just you know just have one just set chart that says the big that you're Israelite, everybody else is not. Uh, and that's what I in, in my books I kind of cover the globe, and I show people the different things that kind of told tribe chart and make people scratch their heads. Yeah, thank you so much, brother. And I know you you've taken a lot of hits for for that stand. Thank you. And so we're gonna go to yeah. um to brother Josh. Why is the twelve tribes chart dangerous um when trying to prove your Hebrew identity? Well, first of all, Aria came out and admitted the whole thing was a farce. Um, you can go look that up. Um, second yeah. of all, um, the concept of that is it goes back to a problem that lot that our people have. Um, a lot of times. We had these issues, like for instance, right now is identity. We come back to our identity. Instead of us coming together as a people, a lot of times what we'll do is we we'll start taking up causes of other people and other um, <laughs> backgrounds. I mean, um, you kind of look at it like um, you know during the civil rights movement when um, you, you had these um, white women who were having um, problems mm-hmm. in, uh, in society, so they start recruiting these black women, you know, um, and start creating this movement like they was included. And that, that thing is has rebirthed into the Me Too movement. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a movement yeah. of these white of white women being in a situation where they're not, but we're including them and bringing them in where yeah. our own people are slacking and we hurt. So instead of us building together and, and understanding who are who are looking for wherever people really are and bringing us together, we, we have this chart of, of bringing together these people who really and truly don't really give two craps about the situation of our people. So to me, you know, it's, it's I know it sounds raw, but it's it's really the truth, and I, I've experienced that firsthand. So um, it's it's a, it's a twofold thing. One, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. It's not correct. Two, it takes the focus off what we're supposed to be really doing, which is gathering the actual um true um descendants of Jacob and bringing them back as a nation. Thank you so much, Brother Josh. And we hear some background noise. So if you're not um, asking or answering a question, if you could just go on mute, we would appreciate that. And we want to remind everyone at 930, we're going to open up the phone lines. And so please press 1 so you can ask your questions or even give a comment. Um, We would love to hear from you. And so I'm going to move on to um, Brother Jarrell. Why is the 12 Tribes chart a dangerous way to um, to prove your Hebrew identity. Right. Um, you, you know, the other brothers, they, um, they explain it very good. Um, uh, it, what it does is that it, it, it creates an anti-African sentiment, and um, it keeps our people from their roots and, and the very essence of where they come from. You know, there's a lot of um, – it creates a lot of colorism and featureism. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, pertaining to that. Not only that, though, it, it, it creates a mentality where I don't come from nothing, you know, we all over here. It, it creates, uh, if I can say this, a bastard mentality. Whereas yes. the, people, the people over in West Africa, you know, they have the same uh, ancient ancestors that we have. But so but the thing is, over here, we claim that we don't have those, their, their mother and fathers is not the same as ours. And we're, we're, we're walking around without any origin. But yet we claim to be Hebrews, and that's not biblical. The Bible tells us where, it explicitly tells us where the Hebrews would be lodged, mainly, you right. see, where they would be lodged until the time of their redemption, you see. So that's the reason why the 12 tribes chart is very dangerous, and we got to get rid of it as soon as possible. Yeah. And I do agree. I've studied colorism for a while, and I noticed, one, all, how are most of the tribes from one, you know, hemisphere in the world? But, two, the 12 tribes chart has been used as a way to even um, 
you know, downgrade the features of, you know, Mm -hmm. people who look African, especially when it comes to the sisters. And I do agree with the brother, like with, you know, Me Too was started by a black sister working with poor Mm -hmm. women. And now, you know, a a woman who was bumped at a Hollywood party, now she gets to, um, you know, be the face of Me Too, as opposed to the homeless sister in New York that the the movement Mm. was made for. And of course, sexual harassment is serious. And we're against that, but I'm just saying, you know, sometimes one thing Israel was um, punished for many, many times was chasing after other nations, looking to other nations for salvation. Mm-hmm. And I work every, anyone who knows me, I work with anyone. I'll give anyone this knowledge. I'm not, you know, a hate-filled person. But um, right. again, <laughs> when it comes to prophecy and world history and our redemption, we have to be serious. Um, and we, we, we have to um, follow what has proof and what has been ordained by Yah, because this is not a game. You know, Israel is deporting mm-hmm. thousands of African people. You know, I have a Kenyan Hebrew brother who was turned away at the airport in Israel when he was going to study, going through so much stuff. It was all over the Jewish newspapers. And so when it comes to incidents like that and we're playing around with the chart and our people are dying because of their identity, that's that's really um, not wisdom. And so, actually, with that question about what happened to my Kenyan brother, um, Yehuda, when he was trying to go um, study Hebrew in Israel, and he was turned away at the airport, um, one thing I noticed in my research is a lot of European Jewish organizations are um, reaching out to Hebrews in Africa, renaming them Jews, making them undergo a conversion when I don't know how you convert to your bloodline, um, causing a lot of issues, um, money, you know, you support some tribes, you don't support other tribes, and then two Hebrew tribes are beefing with each other because one is affirmed by white Jews and the others are not. And so mm-hmm. I want all the brothers to ask, and I won't put Yah- Brother Yahoo up first, um, I'll put Brother um, Ron up first. What is the danger? Because <laughs> we talked about this. What is the danger of European Jewish organizations working with Hebrews in Africa? Oh, uh, well, one, they come in and then they make themselves believe, or, or the people in Africa believe that we're all like of the same stock. Uh, and not not only that, they come in with their Talmudic Jewish. Uh, 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 Talmud. I mean, they're, they're, the mysticism, the Kabbalah, the Mishnah, the Zohar, all this stuff is really an abomination. And it's, it's basically, uh, when you read the Talmud, I don't see how anybody could, uh, any person could read it and be like, this is, this is actually the, what we're supposed to be following. It. And, you know, so all the stuff with, with taking a bath uh, and purification and changing the name to a Hebrew name and adopting some of their customs that they say that the rabbis say that they must keep. And you know, is 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 foolish because, like uh, the brothers were saying earlier, uh, the Hebrew Israelites, this is their way of life. They, I mean, they they're just, they're just doing this because this is what uh, the 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 law of Moses, the Mosaic law, you know, commanded them to do. So this is ingrained in their culture and their traditions. It's not something that they called uh, a religion like Judaism. Um, like you know, like you said earlier, they copied our traditions and customs and our way of life, and they termed it Judaism and added all this other stuff onto it which is basically an, an abomination. Um, but I think that, you know, when they come over there, you know, you can't you, you can't say that you have the same bloodline and stock. You can't say, well, I'm, oh, I'm from the tribe of Judah. Oh, we're from the tribe of Judah. Oh, I'm a, I'm a Levite. I'm a Kohenite. And, you go, and the Lemma Jews, you say, oh, you guys have the same uh, Kohenite, uh, half a group, uh, J, half a group, great gene as us. And no, we're not the same. The, the Lemma Jews are not the same. Uh, as any rabbi that says they're, they're from the lineage of Cohen or Levi, and they're saying that the lemmas are the same, it's, 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 it's confusing, and it's really uh, uh, when they go in there, they they just basically confuse a certain Hebrews, and I'm not going to name any names, so that they believe that they are of a certain bloodline of stock of certain Israelites, uh, including the Ashkenazis, including the Sephardic Jews, and maybe even the Mizrahi Jews as well. And and that is totally false to say that the the Ebo Jews or the Yorubas or the Awe are of the same bloodline of stock as the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic Jews and the Mizrahi Jews. This is false. Uh, and, and and when they come bring their teachings, it, it also corrupts and taints 
uh, what the real message and teaching should be taught um, to the people that are, are waking up. Thank you, Brother Ron. And one story from my field research is when I was supporting a Hebrew community in Ghana, um, you know, they they know who they are. They know how they migrated. They have one synagogue in the town. And then once they started connecting with the white Jewish world, somehow Kabbalah was brought in. And because in Africa they do not play when it comes to the supernatural you know, the leader ended up leaving, half the congregation ended up leaving because someone was bringing in Kabbalah prayers. And now in that mm-hmm. town, there's at least two or three different Hebrew communities in part because of that. So that's one of the dangers. Wow. And so Brother Josh, yeah, it's, it's really a shame. And they're trying to, the younger people are trying to rebuild, but this is one of the examples. Brother Josh, what are the dangers? of European Jewish organizations working with Hebrews in Africa? Quick story. So I'm at work. So I work full time. And um, <laughs> I'm heading out to a work retreat. And there's a um, Thank you, lady who's Thank riding you, with us. <laughs> and um, <laughs> she um, decides that uh, she wants to get in a conversation. So, and another bro- another um, guy was asking me about um, what do I do? And I thought, uh, give him the whole lowdown about who we are and what we do. I'm trying to condense it down because it's very long. Of course, very long, big subject. And so in the midst of that, she did exactly what you just, what you just now said, which is um, started bringing up, oh, oh so, the, you know, how do you, what do you feel about Kabbalah? How do you feel about, um, mainly her, her thing was Kabbalah. And then she proceeded to tell me that she is Cohen, and then her, um, which, is, <laughs> which sounds funny in general, just saying that. And, um, and so I said, oh, okay, cool. I said, well, um, have you ever heard of, um, I said, have you read the New Testament? And she said, yeah. I said, well, um, have you ever heard of a guy named um, uh, um, Simeon in the scripture? And she's like, yeah. I said, well, if you read Acts, um, Acts 3, what you will find out is that um, um, when he was in Antioch, the Greeks called him what we call, now we say nigger, but back then, you know, the white people would pronounce that nigger. I was like, because he was black. Well, they call him wow. black or whatever from that area. What just happened when you, when you study him, you'll find out that he was a priest. He was a Levite. Mm. And then she's like, oh, 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 really? Said, yeah, yeah. So, um, but they called him Niger. That was, that's, that's what the Greeks called him when they saw him. And that's why I said, let me show you some photos. I put out my phone, and I pull, I pull up the, um, the, the Lakish release, and I started showing them pictures of the Levites <laughs> with their dreadlocks. <laughs> she's like, oh, mm. oh. The artist said, well, oh, you know, can you send me that photo? Because, you know, I'm an artist, and I sculpt, and I think this would be really nice. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah, because I heard about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah cool. You know, we're all the same people. Act, ah, no, not. <laughs> we're not. Um, again, you, if you have uh, common sense, you can't get um, um, two different groups, two ethnic groups from one group of people. Like again, from the from the exact same stock, they, they just don't work that way. So, so saying to say this, what do I feel like? I feel like that that they're um um. Their motives are um, devious. I, um, I believe that again, you, you can't trust the people who in who basically were the financiers of your slavery. Mm-hmm. You go back to you know, the history, you find out that they're, they're the ones who own the um, slave ports, they own the slave ships. Um, they're the ones who wrote um, the curse of um, a curse of Ham. Ham. Um, mm-hmm. It was yeah. the Talmud that got translated into the Hamite curse that they start teaching in these churches that they push in the synagogues. They're the ones who mm-hmm. created these stereotypes about you. Where do you think the menstrual shows mm-hmm. came from? Who watched, who watched mm-hmm. the menstrual shows when they were on the plantation? So all of a sudden, now they yeah. come to West Africa and they're interested in black Israelites. Yeah, my face. So, <laughs> so saying that, say this. Um, I think it's a humongous problem, and I think the reason why they're doing this is because they feel like this is their last ditch effort before um, the, the full awakening mm-hmm. of our people. They're trying to find, their, mm-hmm. uh, find them a place amongst Israel. So, um, that's the reason why, like I said, the conversation that we have right now, um, everybody has call is important to try to expose what they're trying to do. Yeah, and when you talk about the financing of the slave trade, people have to, I know for a fact due to the work that I do, that when these groups come into Africa, they're building schools, they're building hospitals, they're giving donations. And I've even seen that tear apart, you know, Hebrew communities in Africa where everyone was one and now someone then went off and started something and again, you know, once the white Jews give you a stamp of approval, you're accepted. What about the tribes who don't? Um, 
And it, the money has caused a lot of issues on the ground. And one thing I want to say, I know, you know, financially it can be difficult in Africa, though not every African person is poor. I want to dispel that myth. But I just want to encourage my Hebrew brothers and sisters, don't trade your birthright for a bowl of soup. Like, mm. don't trade your birthright yeah. mm. for financial support. But I also yeah. want to ask my <laughs> brothers and sisters in the diaspora, anytime I go to Africa to build with Hebrews, um, I try to collect donations from my people at home and give it to them to show them they are blacks in America, you know, in England, you know, in Latin. They're, your people can give to you too. And that's very psychologically, that is um, – very important and so we also we can't just be wanting to study people and write about them but we also gotta how are we helping our own people and so but i i did want to um bring up just what the finances is actually doing to tear apart some hebrew brothers and sisters i've seen some very disturbing things and so brother Jarrell, what do you think about the issue why is this dangerous oh well the reason why it's dangerous is because um, it's 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 causing the people to divorce. I, I could say divorce themselves from their own identity. You know, um, uh, they come over there and they try to convert the African Hebrews that are over there, and got them wearing prayer shawls and you know their style of dress. And, you know, but the thing is, is that these people already do circumcision. You know, they're already practicing Sabbath day. They already have um, original Hebrew names. They also have oral histories that that will define who they are. You know what I'm saying? So the thing is, they don't need European Jewish validation to tell them who they are. You know, so that that's the problem. And... It's what it's doing is masking who they are inherently, what they are already inherently have and were was born with and was passed down to them from generation to generation. Thank you so much, Brother Jarrell. And we know we have callers um, dialing and to please, please press one so you can ask a question. I want to just give the question to Brother Yahoo, and then I have a um, special question for Yahoo and Jarrell. Sure and a special question about this exciting documentary for Josh and Ron. So, um, Brother sure. Yahoo, why is this dangerous? Uh, well, you see, um, I mean, everything about it is dangerous. Uh, you can't, essentially, you can't have to your land and, you know, tell them to, telling, you know, telling you to, you know, take on their ways and that when they themselves, they, they adopted the tradition. So, you know, in, in a sense, you've come to ask yourself, who made them the spokesman? of your forefathers. So, you know, it, it you know, just can't happen that way. And um, it also promotes um, the stealing of traditions and, and cultures. Mm. Um, and uh, I'll just lay this out because um, I've done a lot of research on the quote unquote Lemba in South, in South Africa. And um, if you, you see, the thing is, what's really important, if you, if you really want to know about a people, you have to really study them, like study their, their language, study their culture, and you'll be able to pick out who they are apart from other people. Uh, these Lemba people that the, uh, the Jewish put on the uh, pedestal are actually shown up people. They're not Lemba. Lemba is actually a subtribe of the Vazenda mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. out in South Africa. If you remember the stuff about and all that and the Goma Lungundu that, you know, the Lemba people said that they carried, that's all traditions coming from the Vavenda people. Their story states that, um, that their God appeared to them in the form of fire and thunder and lightning on a mountain where, you know, they were given this, uh, this object. And uh, they, they have uh, much evidence to, to Hebrew tradition. And um, the thing about that is that the Jewish people, they haven't, in a sense, put any light on them, they actually move mm-hmm. away from them and use the different tribes to speak on behalf of them and call this tribe uh, something that they're not. So mm-hmm. I, that's yeah. one instance that, that I found. And, you know, it's, it's very dangerous because, again, it, you know, 
I know many of our brothers and sisters, they want the validation of the Jewish people because once they see the Jews coming to Africa and say, oh, you know, these people are Hebrews, these people are Hebrews, they're like, oh, you see, you know, you know they're trying to help us out, this and that. But, it's, it's, I mean, is that really the case? Are they really on our side? You know, what, what is it that they're really trying to do and what is their agenda? That, that's what's more important. And, you know, I, yes. I'll just leave it at that. And see, that's an important situation where you have an overarching tribe but then one subgroup of the tribe has been pulled exactly. out, probably mm. in the resources. Now, what does that do for the, the family unit, so to speak? And exactly. I know the Limba elders have actually, um, they're very standoffish, and they don't always welcome the Jewish visitors who come. Um, and uh, so I've, mm. I've heard stories from the ground, and even Jewish people say, oh, the Limba flat out told me we don't accept X, Y, Z people, the elders. You know, that doesn't mean the regular people. So, Brother Yahoo and Jarrell, we've been saying this word all night, and thank you, everyone, for answering <laughs> that question. Um, no we've been saying, and you know, I, I'm struggling with this V and this V, but my heart knows this <laughs> word. Yeah. You know, my heart knows, my spirit knows this hallelujah. Um, the yes. Evwe, um, and you can connect, correct me. The Evwe are... This is the original way that our ancestors said, um, called, this is the original name that we were called, kind of the original yeah. way of saying Hebrew. The Gadami, yeah. the Yoruba, the Ewe people, yeah. um, many yeah. different, the Bantu people, many different groups that we've been talking about tonight actually were originally called Ewe. And so Ewe. what is yeah. this one? How do you pronounce it? What is the significance uh, of this word, <laughs> and um, how can we yeah. learn? Yeah, you you you're gonna have to help me offline, but my heart knows. <laughs> um, right, what no is problem. the significance of this word in understanding oh. African Hebrews? Break that down, Yahoo, Jarrell. Y'all just go back and forth. Okay, I, I'll begin. Okay, so the name okay. ever was uh, was written as the consonant Ivory. And the Jewish people know the name as ever, as ever, or, or ever. And um, uh, this, this name is the true name of, of what people call, uh, quote-unquote, Hebrew. You see, Hebrew is an English translation that derives from Hebraicus of Latin. And Hebraicus mm -hmm. of Latin derives from this word ever. And uh, if you go back to the Torah, not the Holy Bible, if you go in the Torah, you'll find that Abram was first called Ivri, where the proper pronunciation should be Ever. Ever. And uh, the name of, uh, of Ever, um, according to Maudi Maudi, he said that the, the name meant uh, uh, the children of God, because we are called after Yeveh, the, the god Yeveh. That's, that's the name of the, the, the god of the, of the people. And um, mm -hmm. in the 1800s, uh, Jacob Spieth, a German missionary, when he came to uh, the Eva people, he asked them, you know, certain questions about, you know, the God that they served. And they told, and this could be found in uh, the book of um, Deuteronomy, verse, uh, chapter 4, verses 22, I believe. They said that um, their God lived in a space surrounded by fire. And if you look back in, the, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 22, it says, the, the verse there says that what people have, have spoken to God in the midst of fire and lived. So they already associated their God, you know, with thunder, with lightning and all that. Not that he is a God of thunder and lightning and fire, but that they associated him with these aspects because this is how he appeared to them in that form. And uh, I'll pass it on to uh, uh, Brother Jarrell. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Brother no Jarrell, what's the significance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to uh, bounce off um, Brother Yahoo, um, the name Azza is uh, indigenous. It was yes. mm -hmm. actually it's ancestral. It's ancestral mm -hmm. to the Eva people, and they use it in their culture. Whether they're naming the land, whether it's called um, we have the land Evan Yegba, which is from Ghana, Tog Ghana in the Volta region, Togo, Benin, Dahomey mm -hmm. in Nigeria. Okay, mm -hmm. that whole area was called Eva land, and. Um, you have also, you know, like Brother Yahoo said, um, we were called the children of Yeze. It's either um, Evervio in, in, in the plural or Evervi in the singular. 
So we see the name Ever being used in in the culture. They're naming the land after it. The people are named um, after this name. It's an ancestral name. And uh, there's a lot of controversy but, um, pertaining to uh, the pronunciation, the different pronunciation of that word. A lot of people will try to say, well, it's called Eber, Ebri. And the thing is, none of those, none of these names are found in West Africa. The name that's found in West Africa that covers the whole uh, spectrum of the region from Ghana to Nigeria is Everland, which is translated as Hebrew land, you see. Mm -hmm. So um, we also have um, in the scriptures, God says, if our people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith Mm -hmm. and shall turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, Mm -hmm. I will heal their land. He says, my people which are called by my name. The thing is, the the different names that people try to use, none of those Mm -hmm. names are similar to God's name, which is Yevah, you see. But the name Ezeh is is similar to the name Yevah, because they are the children of God. He he scripture God calls us his children, you see. And Yevah is the... um, uh, the, uh, the God of thunder and lightning. The only reason why they refer to him as that is because this is their memory of him, and they have a culture that goes along with that. So yes, yeah. um, and plus yeah. in scripture, that that's the Hebrews' core ethnic identity. Yeah. You know, so and uh, yeah. May, may I just add uh, one more thing to that? Um, mm-hmm. The word Haya, the word Haya is the future form of the word Yahweh. That's how they used to say it, the, the uh, theologians, before, you know, before, it came, yeah, be, before it came Yahweh. So um, yeah, the word Yahweh was actually a, a, a corruption of the, of the word Yahweh. When you look at the word Yahweh, Yahweh is actually a corruption of the word Yahweh, how the, how the mm. other people used to call their God. The problem came with not being able to pronounce the Velan character. Because you see, yes, the Velan like character. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you did good sister. <laughs> but um, the Velan character is an ancest- is an ancest- ancestral um, ancestral character, and it's found among particular tribes out in West Africa. So um, th- that's one of the problems that these you know these European missionaries had trouble with, and so they substitute it naturally with the uh, W character, and that's how you get Yahweh. From uh, well, that, yeah, that's how you get yeah, away from Yavé. Yeah, and and mm-hmm. the sad thing is, many of these Europeans changed um, these these people's names. Like when you look at the Yoruba, yeah. many Yoruba don't even mm-hmm. know that this is their original name. But when exactly. you know different explorers came, they couldn't pronounce it like me. And so one part of privilege, like white privilege, instead of humbling yourself and learning what to call someone, mm. you rename them. And remember, Mm -hmm. Adam was given the power to name the animals by Yah. So when you name someone, you're almost saying you have dominion over them. And so um, Mm, that's like when people can't pronounce my name, they try to give me something else or give an, you know, African person a Western nickname. So they can, no, that's (laughs) actually trying to take dominion. So this is a key part of understanding African Hebrews. And so I want everyone in the audience to get the book. The Bible is the black man's history book. You can get the call to the Hebrews, which I love, but it's out of print. So it's going to be a little yes. bit um, pricey, yes, it is. but there's also, um, there's also the website brothers. Can you give the website and give big bro's name again for everyone? Sure. Sure. No problem. Uh, that would be ever.org. That would be E R V E R H dot O R G and uh Mawuli would be M A W U L I Mawuvi M A V Oh I'm sorry M A W U V I Mawuli Mawuvi yes. And he is mm-hmm. LA royalty he is a scholar yes, of the, Anyone yes, who's of, teaching about this the work goes back to him and so we want to honor our elder yes. mm-hmm. and um as, before we open up the phone Press one. We are going to have audience Q and A. I want Brother Josh and Brother Ron to 
to talk about the Reclaiming the Throne documentary that is actually focusing on African Hebrews. So, Brother um, Josh, can you talk a little bit about the documentary, who's in it? And then, Brother Ron, I want you to tell the folks how they can support the documentary. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm terrible with names. Ron, I'm going to have to give you every name because there's a lot of names. Um, well, off the top of the head, we have, um, of course, uh, Ron um, Dalton, Hebrews and Negroes. Um, there's a uh, Pastor Kelly um, Richardson and um, um, Kevin Waiters, like I'm terrible with names. Um, Run, um, Run Divine Prospect. There is uh, man, who am I missing? Who, who am I missing? Um, I'm missing. Uh, majors, yeah. majors. Yeah, yeah, majors. Um, uh, um, Apostle S. C. Johnson, uh, Lucas Cameron, Seven Trumpets Prepper. Prophetic Whirlwind, Only Love Chicken Austin. Uh, of course, who else we got? Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Aquete. Rabbi Aquete. Yeah, Aquete. Yeah, I'm a. Yeah. Yeah. I told you, I get in trouble when I saw it. Like, oh, sorry, I remember her name. <laughs> and then uh, and Zadok. And Zadok. Oh, and Zadok. And Zadok. Yeah, yeah. So, um, essentially, uh, oh, the, all watchman, these... the Watchman, the Watchman, the Watchman. And the Watchman. Watchman. And the Watchman. <laughs> And Deborah and Holda and her and Deborah, husband. Deborah, yeah, Deborah. Oh, yeah. Deborah. Oh, man. Yoshi Yahoo and Holda. Yeah, 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 yeah. This look, this is why I need Morris. See, Morris on the phone. He's rattling them off. Morris off his head. Um, yeah. Hi, um, every, everybody that's um that's involved in the video, they're um, strong brothers and sisters in this in this and in, in the faith and in research. So um, the whole context is to to do two things. Two things we're trying to do with this video. We're trying to finally put out um a mainstream documentary to tell our own story. Because like um, Only Love said at the beginning of this, especially with Ashkenazis, the Ashkenazis are going over, they're trying to create their own narrative concerning us. Um, mm. And um, we got to counteract that. So not only are we dealing with the Ashkenazis going to try to create their own, own nar- narrative concerning us, we also have the camps, a lot, a lot of camps, and, I'm, and I ain't dogma camps, but they um, misrepresent us. So we got this misrepresentation of who we are out there, and then we also have um, the um, uh, these other people who are trying to tell um, our story from their lenses, which of course is a tainted version. So hopefully, um, with with all these brothers and sisters coming together on this project, uh, we can get this information out to the four corners, and so we can put it in in, in a format where um, uh, where it, it's, it's digestible. In other words, it's it's all there together. It's something that um, that, um, that people can be able to grasp onto, and it's nothing that um, we we'll have limitations with. Because um, everybody that's on this call does some type of YouTube video. Everybody on this call and, um, got YouTube documentaries and that that sort of thing. And then when you, the, the only thing about a YouTube documentary um, is great when you just want to get information out, but it's very limited as to what you can do with it, right? So um, if we just did it in that format and we try to put it on YouTube. It would be out there for people to get, but let's say if we wanted to, um, um, if we wanted to, to make um, print DVDs and send them to West Africa or something like that, we want to take them to some other place. It'd be a problem if we want to put it into um, into a, uh, any type of other digital stream so anybody can get it. It's going to be a problem. So um, with this, and like I said, when it, and I'm, I'm gonna let Ryan explain some of the um, details of how we're trying to do it. Um, we're trying to get it so we we crowdfund this thing. And so um, it's, uh, we all come together. And putting this project together and have this information out there, so it won't be bur- burdensome on one group, you know. And then we can be able to get um, this message and hopefully wake the people up and do some of the things we've been talking about on this call, like unite our people, educate um, our people um, in other places who have um, uh, no idea of these things we're talking about. I mean, run tell you run can get into because um, um, sometimes we, when we talk about even right now we're talking about West Africa and we're talking about um, North America and we're talking about South America and, and the islands um, in the West Indies, but we got people that send some specific aisles. I mean, we when the scripture says that we scatter to the four corners of the earth, it means to the four corners of the earth. So, um, so hopefully, like say, um, through this movie, which is called Reclaiming the Throne, um, we have the ability um, to do that. Ron, you want to speak on that a little bit? You, you about to say I just wanted Ron? to quickly um, say that um, the focus of the documentary is um, Hebrews in Africa and different people talking about it from that perspective. Yeah. And we'll also be talking about East Africa as well. But Brother Ron, um, anything you want to say? And then please tell people how they can support and how they can find yeah. the trailer. The trailer is beautiful. 
Oh, okay. Well, the, the, what we're trying to do, uh, of course, you know, the Jews run Hollywood, and the distribution companies that distribute these movies, like Walt Disney um, and MGM and, and, and uh, all these different uh, Universal pictures, they're the ones that are allowing these movies like uh, Black Panther to show in the movie theater. And we all know that uh, Black Hollywood and Jewish Hollywood and a lot of our rich black entertainers, uh, they're not, you know, we haven't seen a Hebrew movie yet. We, we've always seen these movies with uh, Noah and Exodus, Gods and Kings, and and you know they got a movie coming out with the Apostle Paul. And everything, every time they show us, they show us to be beggars and slaves and thieves, and they show everybody in the Bible to be white, and and that's not true. And so you know, we we can't wait for for Black Hollywood, Jewish Hollywood, anybody else to do a movie about our, our true history. Uh, unless we do it, unless we do it ourselves and ask the support of other people that want to see a movie like this, because, you know, we all know that, you know, we can see movies about Miles Davis, we can see movies about white supremacy, we can see movies about uh, slavery and the civil post-Civil War, Jamaica, Haiti, uh, but it, when you go deeper into the history, this is when we're going to really understand the truth, because um, uh, the Bible talks about you know, the truth, not knowledge will set us free. Knowing the truth will set us free. But the truth is out there, but we don't know the truth. So it says, and ye shall know the truth. But the part, part is mm-hmm. we got to know the truth. The truth is out there. We just don't know it. So so yeah. these these coonery and buffoonery movies is not showing us the truth. And so th- this kind of movie is going to show the truth. It's going to mm. probably slap black America and everybody in their face like, wake up, y'all. We've been sleeping. They've been, they've been duking us. They've been... They've been tricking us, and now coming out with a movie uh, that's funded uh, by us, for us, and we urge everybody to support because this is the only way we're going to have this movie come out to be the best way that it can, can be because we want it to be quality. We don't want it to be no no basement uh, put-together backdoor film. We want to have it HD, 4K footage. We want to have everything as bad as that it needs to be present, presentable for a film festival, for small theaters, uh, uh, Voodoo, uh, Netflix, Amazon. We want this to spread everywhere so people can get the real history of who we are as a people. So people can actually donate to, to this to this movie project by going to www.gofundme.com backslash reclaiming the throne. So you just got to type in www.gofundme.com backslash reclaiming the throne. All all in one one big word. And you can see the people that's been donating and what their comments are. Comments are people are really excited, and we're we're, we're getting we're getting numbers, we're getting money that's going to help with the the production costs, the filming, the cameras, the the footage, everything that we need to put this together. And of course, um, all of the uh, Hebrew edu- educators, teachers, book authors, filmmakers, uh, we're all going to paint and tell our story from our perspective, and to really uh, wake up wake up the world. And so, you know, Jewish Hollywood doesn't want to see this happen. They want to sleep. They want to they want to keep watching Black Hollywood. I mean Black Panther and saying, Oh, it's the kingdom, oh Black Holly- Black Panther's the best movie ever. It's the kingdom, it's the kingdom. But the kingdom is really what well, we're gonna show you to be the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. And and thank you, brother Ron, and though I'll be at Black Panther with my little outfit on with my friends, we'll never be told that the women warriors are based on a warrior group of Hebrew women from Dahomey right. that yeah. were fighting for their Definitely. people. You won't get that. And so <laughs> to find the trailer, yeah. you just type in Reclaiming the Throne in YouTube. Please watch it. Please support. We're not being paid for the documentary. But in order to get in film festivals and on screens, you do need a certain level of support. We can't have people tell our stories like Jews of Nigeria doing Jewish about the Sefwe in Ghana and then we're going to see someone else tell our story. We got to tell our own. Mm -hmm. And so with that, please press one if you have questions. I want to thank the brothers for being with us so far. We'll make sure that we close out in prayer and give everyone's contact info before we get on. But right now, I just want to um, open the lines up. And Sal, if you, you, um, I know we had some people on the line. Can we start taking um, audience questions? All right, family, this is your time. This is your time to ask questions in the comments. Again, that number is 319-527-6239. You can call in via phone, call in via Skype, 
and uh, feel free to ask your questions. For the new listeners out there that's calling in, there's no foul language. you got to keep it clean, keep it professional once you call into the show. But let's open up the phone lines. Let's go to 504-516. You're live in air. Hi, Shalom. 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 Hi. Um, I remember you were saying something um, in reference to um, how they don't like when the insiders um, come in and they perpetrate and, um, you know, they're trying to watch them and get their uh, take on, hence why we have a lot of perpetrators, um, you know, in general, hence, you know, the Jewish, the Roman Catholics, um, the Christians, you know what I mean? Um, but also you were speaking in reference to, um, I just want to comment on that. You were speaking in reference to how, um, you know, uh, finances were utilized. Now, isn't that a, um, a particular reason as to the way to be set apart? Like that's one of the reasons to be set apart because – money does have a tendency to um, infiltrate people and disbar them and, you know, and scatter them as well as, like, um, me and my each, we were talking um, in reference to should we actually do a community or, you know, somehow get together and unify um, because we see how money tears apart, um, wouldn't it be a great idea to um, somehow – uh, promote bartering to the best of you know amongst us, not to you know other nations. Um, what what are what are your thoughts? Mm. Great question about alternative economics, brothers. You have any any thoughts about that? Uh, I could. Does anybody want to go first, or? Are you... <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to. I, what I'm, uh, I guess I'm trying to figure out. Is she talking about not using money and other things to do trade amongst each other? Is uh, is, is that what you're asking? Or yes, that's 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 pretty much because you know as 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 um, El Shaddai wanted us to do was you know mm-hmm. to be set apart. So why mm-hmm. would we, you know, kind of scorn ourselves because money is an issue. Money is yeah, an issue true. when it comes down to us. It, 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 it's it's a form of power, and it easily persuades yeah. us, you know, for the for the love of money is what, you know, should so somebody. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I, yes, well, exactly. So I mean, that's my that's my perception as to, you know, kind of branching away from society as much as possible, um, mm-hmm. with all their mighty ones that they, you know, money is a mighty one. Well, that's just, you know, that's my thought. Oh, go ahead. Oh, um, are you, you finished? I, I just wanted to, that was all your whole question? Yeah, it's a question Hello? slash comment slash thoughts, you know, thoughts on this. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I would say, you know, scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil. I don't, I wouldn't say that money, money itself is, and I, I, you know, from that scripture, I think the intention on how people use um, money, that that would be wrong. But um, I think mm-hmm. also to your point, um, I believe that, um, you know, we should get our hands on natural resources so that we could do trade um, amongst each other. And you know, um, practice um, group economics amongst ourselves, especially those of us who have knowledge about who we are as being Hebrews. So, um, yeah, I, you know, probably I, I, I probably agree with what you're saying, um, but I believe it's, it's also the intention on the intentions of the heart on how money is used as well. Yeah, and yeah. I think one thing is definitely a question to think about. One thing, um, you know, so um, one thing, the Jews don't just give physical money, but they give um, products like prayer books and talit Mm -hmm. and fringes. So 
um, for this particular issue, even if money is not being exchanged, the products can still be used to control people or mm. helping someone be able to go to rabbinical school or go to Israel. That might not be physical money, um, but it it will actually be, you know, a product. But I think your question is something, you know, we should definitely consider, you know, group economics and how are we working definitely. with each yeah. other. Um, and so anyone else want to answer the sister's question? And thank you so much, sis, for calling in. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I can uh, expound on that. I think I think it's important uh, that we learn how to have our own economy within an economy, and whether we mm-hmm. use it with money in the system until the money crashes and they come up with a digital currency system, or whether we barter. I definitely think that 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 the set apart Israel needs to start depending on each other, because when you look at the Jews, I mean they have uh, uh, Jewish um, community centers uh, all over the United States of America, and a lot of times some of these are so big that they call them campuses, and any Jewish person can come. And if you if you need work, if you need transportation, if you need housing, if you need schooling, if you need if you need a loan for a house or a business, they got the Hebrew free loan that you can get a loan if you're Jewish without interest to start whatever venture you're trying to do. Uh, and so you see the Jews opening up yeshivas, they're opening up synagogues, they're opening up all types of stuff, they're owning everything. And the Chaldeans and the Indians and the Asians, they've all followed suit so that they have generational wealth and they really don't need us unless they want to make money off of us, which, which, is the, yeah. which they do all the time. Uh, but we as uh, the connection with the Israelites in America and in Africa, uh, we got to learn how to start helping each other and, and, and opening up the, the communication lines because, you know, we shouldn't have to be borrowing money from the, I, from the IMF and the World Bank and the Jews and, the, and, and borrow money from the Chinese and, and all these other people and getting enslaved or softly colonized by them because we, yeah. we have all these different divisions, language and tribes and clans and, and different things and religions. I think that we once we start waking up, we should start to you know do everything we can to start to survive on our own because we're going to need to when uh, stuff hits the fan when when this tribulation starts to uh, end days uh, scenario starts to play out. Thank you so yeah. much, Ron and oh, Brother Josh. You wanted to say something really quick before we go on. I was just going to comment on that, but just agree with basically what Ron oh, no. said. So let's go. Yeah. Oh, please mm-hmm. comment. Please comment, Brother Joe. So I was just saying, um, you know, whoever finds you, runs you. So, um, mm-hmm. and I think that's kind of what you was getting at. And we're both <laughs> doing, um, at. So, um, you, you don't. So if you can, if you can pull that off, I mean, if you can, um, if we can, as a people, practice, um, you know, I, I forget what um, the professor, he calls it powernomics. Um, mm-hmm. What's the professor's name? I can't think of his name right now, but. Um, basically working with uh, Claude Anderson, Dr. Claude Anderson. Claude Anderson. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what the other nations do. I mean, now, they do that on purpose because um, we're the battery that makes the co- economy run. If, if there's no, yeah. if there is no Black America to to finance the, um, <laughs> uh, to, to be the um, buyers, and if there's no um, West African countries for them to raid for resources, then the whole entire system collapse. So. Um, mm-hmm. um, we can go back to some other things, and it's just even going back to what we talking about the two things being connected, about the the Hebrew connection, because both the um, people on both continents are still being used for the foundation of um, another person, another uh, other nation's benefit. So I, um, mm. so bartering would be a good way. I, but I, I agree with um, with what Ron said about how it's, it's going to be still difficult until we can um, Hello, we brother. come out. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry, today. You, you were cutting up a little bit. Can you repeat your last sentence? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think it's still going to be difficult for us to do this um, well right now in this captivity until we can get um, so we can kind of get on our own because um, that's been the problem. I mean, that's that's what the reason why um, the slave trade is happening in Libya is because Gaddafi had that same thought, right? Um, um, he, you know, people in, in certain countries in Africa having all these resources, then um, why why are, are we um, taking currency from other nations? Why why are we letting them raid, come and raid this when we can we can back our own own and, and have our own, right? And so what happened? They went down there and they killed them. They, they took them down because it, it was a threat to the dollar. So um, 
and right now we run into the same issue in in America in that we we you know we understand that we need a system like the sister talking about that we to benefit our own communities. The only problem is how do you go about doing that? Because the only thing that that speaks to power is finances, but you have no power nor no finances. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so something goes wrong, <laughs> right. and you say, let's boycott, yeah. but you got nothing to boycott. So you're going to boycott, right. Right. let's say something happened with a grocery store. You're going to boycott a grocery store when you don't own no grocery store. You're going to boycott mm-hmm. the gas station when you don't own no gas station. You're going to boycott, you know, mm-hmm. it, you, you don't have no financial say. So um, once we get into a place where the most high part, um, like, gathering us together, and we can um, basically um, stop being the um, – the parasite, I mean, not a parasite, but um, be the host and and, um, and not the parasite. You can flip that whole relationship around. We, we're not the ones who, who are being used, but we can have our own. Then we can start to build that together. But um, it's kind of, yeah. not to say it can't be done, because it can be done in small pockets, but being done on a, um, on a large scale, what we're dealing with is, you know, like the scripture talk about the um, confederacy of nations and um and their and, and, and their infrastructure that they've created on the backs of, of, of um our people. So it's kinda of hard to shake that. But I, look, so I'm doing a whole lot of talking to make it some point. But so I think that's where it is. I, I think once we come out of this captivity, then those things are gonna be easier. And if we can practice it and we can do it well and, and um do it. And sometimes that works better in smaller groups than larger groups. Not because necessarily because we don't want to, because of the situation. That's um yeah. thank you so much for that and sister, thank you for um for calling for calling in and that's another reason they want us to despise Africa and mentally distance ourselves because most of the natural resources and the world's wealth is in Africa mm-hmm. in in the Asian community in Europe, even Afrocom, which was started by you know, our government, they're recarving up Africa. And so if you're running yeah. from Africa, that's exactly what they want you to do. So Sal, can we bring on the next caller? All right. Once again, that number is 319-527-6239. Let's go to the next phone uh, phone call. It's 908-463. You're live in air. Yes, yeah, Shalom. How are you, brothers and sisters? Shalom, sister. Shalom. 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 We're good. <laughs> Um, I'm, I, I ask you to forgive me because I'm a little bit under the weather, but I had to call into the show because I'm listening to it, and I'm saying to myself, wow, listen to my brothers and sisters speaking. But there's a couple of things that I wanted to bring out. First of all, I want to acknowledge that I know two people on the panel personally, and Brother Josh, <laughs> I'm getting to know. This is Esther Brown. Um, oh, hi, oh, Esther. Oh, Esther. <laughs> Yeah, my own family didn't even recognize my voice because I sound a little bit like Barry White right now. But um, <laughs> getting back to uh, what I wanted to bring out was this. I think it is so important um, what you said about the dangers of the Ashkenazi going into Africa. And I'm going to tell for all of the people that are listening to this phone call, we must reconnect and support our brothers and sisters in Africa. Put away yes. all of the foolishness. Mm. Yes, because I'm going to yes. tell you something, and I spoke to my sister Oli Love about this and my big brother Ron. Um, I saw a picture, and in the picture it was a, a Hebrew tribe that was in Africa, and then there was an Ashkenazi man standing in the middle of them, and he had his hands in the formation of a mace, uh, mace, um, Freemason leader. And he was dressed in their clothing and everything, and he was talking about how they gave him a new name and everything. And I said, oh, my goodness, and all of a sudden I heard in my spirit, and I speak to Oli Love about this, they come with smiling faces, but their intentions are evil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it right. shocked mm. me when I heard that in my spirit. And um, I just want to – I saw everyone – I encourage you to go watch a video with Stephen Graham where he interviewed Harry Rosenberg. Because in the interview, a lot of people didn't catch that. Um, He asked him a question about um, dealing with the history of the Hebrews in Africa. And Harry said that his, one of his grandfathers, great grandfathers, wrote letters into Africa in the early 1900s because they they were searching for the Hebrews that were in Africa, his own family. And he said that in he said that the reason why they were searching for them was because they needed to know the history, the customs, the practices, and beliefs. Because there are certain things that went on in the tabernacle that they didn't know. And my question uh-huh. was mm. this, and I confronted Harry on this on the Hebrew and Negro show, and he never answered my question. My question was this: <laughs> If this is your history, why don't you know it? Why are you moving mm. down into Africa? 
and, and uh-huh. learning this from the original Hebrews that are in Africa. And then I began to confront Harry on the history of when they were in Russia on the steppes and how Queen right. Catherine, who was, a queen, who was a queen czar in Russia, she confined them in the Caucasus, at which time they started taking over and dominating every other tribe in that area until the Arabs came in and how they yeah. used to wow. cross. The, uh, they were in the Pale of Settlements and how they used to sneak over what they what Jewish people call there's a great mo- there's a great documentary called The History of the Jews Part One and Two that you can find on YouTube. How they used to uh, um, escape out of that area and cross over into Russia, uh, Germany and Poland during the time of the Russian expansion, which they call that crossing the pale. And the thing about mm. it is this: when I asked Harry Harry all these questions and confronted him, he had no words for me. No words. He gave me no answer. And he began to speak to my brother Ron about a totally different subject because he knew that I knew where he was coming from. It is so important. But I wouldn't have known this if I wasn't trying to connect with my Hebrew family in Africa because, see, they hold the key. They hold yes. the key yes. Yes. to our mm-hmm. history. Yeah. We don't know mm-hmm. it unless we read it in a book. But they are literally exactly. our walking history. And it is so yes. important mm-hmm. that we learn from them and support them and we just put away the foolishness and come together because I'm telling you, these Ashkenazis, Jews, they got plans for us because right there on the, on the Hebrews and Negro show, it came right out of Rosie Harenberg's mouth. They got plans on killing us. Mm-hmm. And he, he said it mm-hmm. right out on the show. You goings are going to get dealt with. He said you either follow mm-hmm. along or you die. So they got plans for us, and you know what? And just brothers and sisters, please hear my voice. And I know I sound bad right now. Please reconnect as much as you can with our family in Africa because they are the key to that is go, that y'all is going to use to unlock our history yeah. and play yeah. a big part in waking us up. And I just wanted to say that, and I also too wanted to say, brother Josh, oh my goodness, your lives that you be having, my brother. They are truly something else. I have a notebook and a pen, and I'll be writing down what you be saying, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say you. that, and I just want to say I love you all. I love you all. <laughs> and have Thank a you. Love you too, sis. Thank Black you so you much. God and, bless. and one thing I hey. want to say to follow up to my sister's comments, in Genesis it says, like, unto Judah shall be the gathering. So whoever right. gathers is going to be deemed Judah. And so if you're looking in the wrong place, and you, you, you're, you're off on a different direction, when everything is said and done, people will be able to say, well, we're Judah because we gathered. And so this is very, very critical. It's time out for fables and games because, you know, mm-hmm. prophecy is too rapidly fulfilling for that. And so anyone want to mm-hmm. comment um, to what Esther said um, before we go to the other callers? Uh, well, you know, I, you know, I don't run, run as like a loaded, so you see what I'm saying? <laughs> um, the thing is, like I said, I can't agree with her more. Um, you just look, it's a reason why Mashiach calls them the synagogue of Satan. Mm. So, I mean, I had, I had these conversations with, um, with Ron, and, you know, Ron, Ron, I tell you, every time they mention Harry, I call him Dirty Harry. <laughs> 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 because. I know what he's up to. I mean, like, like, like Esther just said. Why were you going back to um to West, West Africa to learn these histories? They know these things. Like, like I said, I, I read you the quote from um, for Dr. Bodenheimer. I mean, like you said, he said the British rabbis knew we was in um the Niger River in the 1840s. In the mm-hmm. 1840s. So if they knew about it in the 1840s, then why why just now? Why why do you see them coming up doing this? They got something planned. I mean. Um, so again, um, like I said, I agree with her. I, I don't know all the other things that, that Harry, <laughs> that Harry said. Um, I don't, I don't, and I, I kind of jokingly call him Dirty Harry. I, I don't know him personally, um, <laughs> but <laughs> but what I do know is um, when he when he came on to when he was on, on Ron's show and he was disrespecting the Quite and trying to tell the Quite yes. to do it, <laughs> yeah, Quite culture. Right? He, he's on the, how many generations? He, he, he's always had his culture. And they're talking about, oh, well, we got tourist roles. And the queen like, okay, this is my culture. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, man, yeah. when you get to a point where it's, it's just ridiculous. So, so, man, I heard to say, you can't trust, you cannot trust 
the people who stole your identity. You cannot. It's not like they, they stumbled onto your identity. They wrote about it. Mm-hmm. They wrote about fences. You, yeah. you know, in, a, in our documentary, we have the, um, the whole thing about Wida and how um, – they wrote about it in the Portuguese um, encyclopedias and said that it was um, it was a, and the inhabitants were Judaic and was said to be the lost tribe of Israel. So while they was putting you on a slave ship, it knew exactly who you were. And then, and, and then they still stole your identity, right? So saying all that to say this, how could you trust a people that's going that's doing that? That, do I, do that? that means that I'm, I'm condemning every last one of them. No, that's why what I'm saying. What I'm saying is as a movement, when they start to move um, and, um, as, as a team to do certain things, when they, like, again, like, um, um, the guy called himself um, Rabbi Ben Shem- Shemir, and he's talking about how they, how, um, <laughs> um, one of the tribes that named him Judah, and he's like, yeah, it matches up with, with, uh, with my, my, my family name, because we da 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 claim to be from the tribe of Judah. It, it mean, it, it's almost laughable, right? So, so, and, and, saying all this, say this. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Say it again. I don't know if I missed that. No, no, no. It's okay. I'm sorry. What were you saying? Oh, okay. Well, I, I'm going to run my mouth. I'm on a rant. Just, let's keep moving. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> I got that's okay, brother. It's um, okay. It's okay. We do have more yeah. people on the line. And so thank you so much, Esther, for calling in. <laughs> and, again, we need to be wise as serpents and as gentle as doves just because a tribe in Africa is being called Jewish by a white Jewish organization, I've seen people say, see, they're converts. They're not Hebrews. And I'm like, that's the con game. Don't get caught up in that. Use the information to your advantage and pair it with actually talking to the people from that group. So, Brother Sal, can we take the next caller? All right, family, once again, that number to call in is 319-527-6239. I know you guys are enjoying this show. And uh, the show is archived, family. If you didn't know, it is archived. You can check it out later on in the iTunes podcast. Just type in the search box, Debate Talk for You. Of course, we're on Blog Talk Radio at www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Debate Talk for You. And you can check out the archives later on on YouTube. Just type in the search box, Debate Talk for You, and check us out. Let's go to the next caller, though. Let's go to 410-488. You're live on air. Shalom, shalom, Hey, Hello. Hello. Yeah, my Hello. name is uh, Marcia. My name is Marcia Zalquinal Marcia um, Lewy. Uh, my government name is Speller, um, but I prefer uh, to be just called um, Akoth or either Zalquinal Marcia. Uh, I've been really listening intently, and I didn't even know that it was going to be a, a call on um, this evening, but I had the number from a previous show, so I said, let me just dial in and see if there's anything going on tonight. And I've been tied to the phone ever since, and... Um, it's just wonderful to hear, you know, uh, this generation, the, the younger generation, because I've been, um, you know, doing this research and studying be, well before um, Internet and, you know, running back and forth to libraries and talking to people, um, um, you know, that I went to college with uh, back in the day, uh, back in the 70s that were from, quote, unquote, closer, closer to the land, uh, people that were, you know, that called themselves um, uh, Ashante and people that called themselves, uh, quote, unquote, uh, Ethiopians and so forth and so on. Um, and coming back, you know, fast forward into this day, it just amazes me when I still talk to, you know, some of the people who are, quote, unquote, becoming awakened now to whatever degree that they are, that they are clinging to, quote, unquote, these uh, wannabe brews, these, uh, um, you know, these folks that say that they are, and we know now because we are in these latter days and the knowledge has been increased, we know they ain't. Those that are, you know, that, that are awakened, we know they ain't. And, um, you know, but when I look into, um, you know, sometimes it, I would just get so peeved and just get so frustrated when I would talk to people who are, they're almost grinning and skinning because they're assimilating with these, quote, unquote, you know, uh, Jewish in, in their Judaism yeah. mm-hmm. and their Talmud and, and the Mishnah oh. and Gemara and, and just weaving all that into to Torah, you know, it just, it would get, um, it would just peeve me and almost give me a headache. And um, it, it, to, it got to the point where, you know, I would be invited to different places, you know, here and there and yonder, you know, moving around the United States. And because at the time uh, my husband was a musician and I was a musician, so we would, you know, be blessed sometimes to be able to do, you know, some music or some psalmistry. And um, at a certain point in time, you know, I just let it be known that, uh, you know, I, I'm not I'm not with that. Just going to put it like that. I'm not with that. I don't do that. I don't, you know, that's not right. They ain't right. We don't need to be here. 
But what happened was um, um, because Jehovah said that he would move uh, us to jealousy, you know, with these people. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that's in yeah. uh, Deuteronomy 32, mm-hmm. when you just read the whole yeah. thing where uh, Yeshurun is being chastised and admonished and stuff. And Moshe just said what's going to happen. You know, we got out of hand. We got out of pocket. We thought we were slick and fat and all that. And, uh, you know, uh, you will let it be known that, uh, you know, <laughs> we're going to be in a day where uh, we're going to be like, oh, you know, it, it, all this is going to be getting on your nerves so bad because you're going to see these people, these wannabes, and they're going to be, uh, uh, you know, standing like they two feet off the ground over top of you, and then they're going to be running around and thinking that we need validation from them. And then some some of our people actually feel, they actually have bought into the fact that they think that they need validation from these false and fake people. And it's just yep. horrible, but the whole said it was going to happen, so this is where we are. But, you know, um, you know, those of us that have, are awake enough to know that, at least we know that, and when we are around the people that are c- kind of like coming awake and those scales are being removed, we can at least pass that along to them that, you know, wait a minute now, come on, go back and read, what, what you know, what's been written about us. And uh, that, that, that tale, that fast forward, is right where we are now, where we are being, quote, unquote, being moved to jealousy. You know, we just, you know, we're looking at them and saying, what in the world, how in the world they think they're going to convert us and we of the bloodline? You know, but, you know, our, some of our people, they actually, they love going in and taking hold of all of that Talmudic and that, that Mishnah and Gemara mess yeah. and just, just mixing it all in the Kabbalah. And I have been, I have, I have known so many people that have been gotten caught up in that. I started out with years ago, back in the 80s. Uh, when I actually just knew, knew, I mean, knew, knew. I mean, I knew when I was young, but as, as, I, as you know, more and more time went by and I did more study, I was like, wait a minute, why do they think they got to go run to these people to get a stamp of approval? And, you know, they, right. they fell off and they, they went their way, and, and so that's where they are now. And even, um, you know, my husband, um, he went off with them, and he he got caught up in that, uh, you know, the Judaism, Talmudic, Mr. Gamar, so forth and so on, blah, 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 and they pretty much milked him for his quote-unquote, musical talent and gifting that he had, they didn't want me because they knew who I knew. So um, yeah. that was a wedge, and it, mm. it, it, it just, you know, it stayed that way until he passed away a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, and that, uh, that happens to a lot of us because they look out and they see the gifting that Jehovah has given his people, Israel, mm-hmm. that peculiar gifting. Yeah. And when they, when, they, when they see that in us, they, they, they want it. They want, so what, what they do is they go in and they schmooze. But I'm going to tell you right now, there ain't no such thing as no free lunch. When they come in, quote, unquote, mm-hmm. I don't care how much they say, here the coast and lamb, this and blah, 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 that, blah, 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 blah. No, we don't need that from them if we got to eat rice and peas. Right. You know, don't take yeah. that free lunch. We don't need that kosher free lunch because it may not be too hard. It may not be clean. And we don't want to know because we don't need it. When we know what to do, then that's what we need to do. We don't need to look to them fake wannabe brews to validate us to do anything. And remember that Jehovah mm. said that we was, we was gonna be we was gonna be provoked to jealousy. And I'm gonna tell you, I had to keep remembering myself and reminding myself of that. Excuse me for talking so fast, but I get it, I get really no, passionate about that because <laughs> there's been so many people that I had run into that are caught up and tangled up in it. And they embrace it. They wrap themselves in it. I mean, they wrapped up tight, tighter than a head wrap. And um, mm-hmm. you know, you fall out with them because. They look into them for that validation, and some of them, they say, well, you know what, if I didn't convert, then my children wouldn't have a chance to go to yeshiva, and they have traveled. And they did. I said, well, you know what, well, yeah, they bought. I said, but you know what, You're, you or your children don't need to be <laughs> validated. You don't need to convert because you are the people. Exactly. It's in your yeah, blood. Exactly. You don't need them to be Yisrael. Well, we wouldn't have this. and we didn't. I, It just makes me so sick. But then I recognize, okay, wait a minute, boom. That's why you're supposed to be <laughs> feeling like that because you always say you're going to feel like that. So, uh, you know, that that is pretty much it in a nutshell um, uh, that, uh, you know, we were supposed to, you know, be feeling this way some some kind of way, as they say here in Baltimore. I was feeling some kind of way. And every now and again I run into some of them folks that are still like that. They're running in. You know, they got on the Bedouin uh, uh, talits and carrying on and stuff like that, zitzi up with no blue in them, and I just want to slap them in the head. You know, but you know what? Uh, we, are, we are working pro- progress, and, uh, you know, and so am I. But I just want to uh, just, you know, let it be known that, you know, pretty much 
we are where Jehovah said we was going to be at, and just we are just blessed that we have some sort of sort of awakening that we know that we don't have to go in and be validated, you know, by anybody that is not a people because Jehovah said they ain't a people, they ain't His people, but they're gonna mm-hmm. rise up and think that they can come and run us. But you know, don't let them do it, brothers and sisters. Don't let them do it. Don't yeah. let them do it. They mm-hmm. ain't got oh. no. <laughs> they ain't got nothing. Mm-hmm nothing in them to be able to do that for us because they're not a people. But Yehovah said it was going to happen, and here we are. Hallelujah. Yehovah. Yes. Thank yes. you. And one thing I want to say is, you know, a lot of these things like Kabbalah, we have to realize we as Hebrews created some of this stuff that's being yes. used mm-hmm. now against us because we walked mm-hmm. away from Yah. Um, for yes. me, it's, you know, I'm not getting caught up in hate for anyone because, and I do interfaith work, I show up as who I am, even in front of white Jews. They no, my whole thing is when you go to Canal Street and there's a fake coach bag, you might get fooled. But when you put it near a real coach bag, you won't get fooled. <laughs> and so yeah. with the importance of knowing the African yeah. Hebrew information is so we can show the authentic. Because a yeah. lot of people, even from different races, will say academically, those are not the people. But then they say, mm-hmm. well, I guess the people didn't really exist. So it's not only about right. who isn't, which us as Hebrews, we always focus on who isn't, but how do we prove who is? Um, yeah. Because, you know, we can um, get caught up all day long in what others are doing. But if we have our gates closed and we know and our identity is rooted in Yah. No one can fool us. So, sister, I want to thank you for your work, and I'm sorry to hear of your brother's passing. I just want to give Brother Jarrell and Yahoo a chance to respond to your um, to your comment. Brothers, you have anything to say to her um, for the powerful well, comment she made? Well, well, I'm, uh, well, 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 I'm sorry. All right, oh, okay, okay, I'll well, go first. Uh, um, yeah, I just want to wanted to point out the, the scripture she mentioned about how God would provoke us to jealousy. Uh, She's absolutely right. And the scriptures specifically tell us the Gentiles. And who are the Gentiles? They tell you in the book of Genesis, the Gentiles are the children of Japheth. Clearly, those people are taking our identity. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. again, like what she said about, uh, you know, about us converting into Judaism, you know, to Judaism and all that. We don't need any of that stuff, you know. We, We are the true ethnic descendants, the true ethnic yes. people of our forefathers. I mean forget forget the epithets Negro, forget the epithets black. We we're not we're none of that. We're Hebrews, true ethnic Hebrews coming from mm-hmm. Shem. So, you know, we again we don't need any of this stuff. This this was a way of life for us. And, you know, over time we corrupted it with other, you know, forms of, you know, forms of traditions, but this was a way of life for us. And that's how we know that we're the authentic people of the scriptures. And that's mm-hmm. all I'm gonna say. Thank you so Jarrell. much. No problem. Brother Jarrell? Oh yeah. Um uh, also um to add to that, uh, when it comes to um the name Azar, white to European Jews they know they know the the the, the name Hebrew derives from Azar. And the thing is, that is the reason why they will never call themselves Ezra. They will never call themselves Ezra, you see. But they do know that that, that name is the original name of the Hebrews. So um, I, I just wanted to add that little bit. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sister Shalom, to you. Keep the passion that you have. And um, um, Sal, and do we have one more caller? Yeah, we do have one more caller standing by. Again, that number to call in, family, is 319-527-6239. If you're already listening to the show, just simply press number one, and that lets me know that you have a question or a comment. But let's go to this uh, last caller right now, for now. Let's go to 724-518. You're live on air. Hello, Shalom. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Shalom. Uh, Shalom. 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 Hi, I just want to say, uh, first of all, thank for the show, for uh, Sister Only Love giving her the platform to host this show. This is really informative, very educational, 
very uplifting, and I'm just really enjoying it. So thank you. Thank you to all the brothers who are participating and what you shared so far. Um, this has been a blessing, and I, I just really want to appreciate you. Um, and the other thing that I, I really was just thinking about, I have so many thoughts. I, I want to make a cohesive statement and make sense, so just bear with me. But one of the thoughts I, I had was, um, you know, when I came into the awakening of um, of the Hebraic, the Hebraic walk, um, I came in out of the Christian church, and I came through the Messianic Hebrew roots movement. And so for those who don't know what that's about, that's, you know, people who are in the church, uh, predominantly white folks, who are waking up to the knowledge that they've been kind of bamboozled about Christianity and they recognize that they were supposed to attach themselves to Israel. However, they don't know who true Israel is. Mm. And so (laughs) um, in those rooms, in those spaces where you are, you know, you still feel white supremacy. You still feel um, all of the things that come with white privilege because these folks do not, they have not really come into an understanding of who Yacht people are and and what their role is to Yacht people. So, Mm -hmm. Um, what I'm hearing, you know, because I still have, from time to time will go in those rooms and look to see what's going on and hear what the conversations are. And one of the things I've seen is a, this very subtle shift in um, the way they're speaking of uh, Hebrew Israelites. And what I see is kind of a, a small um agreement that, okay, maybe some of us are Hebrews, real Hebrews, but Israel, the state of Israel, that's Judah. And they're regathering us. Kind of when, when Sister Only Love made that comment about whoever is gathering has, is, is going to claim to be Judah, it kind of, you know, rung that bell for me. Um, but, yeah, that, that's absolutely what – What's, the, what's going to be done And they're going to pick and choose who they say The the, the people are So it's going to be mm. You know we're Judah And we say these folks are The people uh, I saw a news article A couple of weeks ago where they were welcoming A group of what looked like um, People from Pakistan um, And they were welcome, welcome the, Welcoming them into Israel And this whole Bill was being given by their news anchor about how these were part of the lost tribes, but they've always known who they were for 2,000 years. And I thought that was so <laughs> ironic. I was like, if they were lost, they knew who they were. Why didn't they go home, you know, like 1,500 years ago? Like I, but, but the point is, is that they're claiming, now they're not saying, oh, it's just us. We're Israel. Now they're saying, oh, we're Judah. And so we, we rule. We get to rule, and we're going to tell you who else is Israel. Mm. And so that is the danger. That's the thing when they go into Africa and they say, okay, we, we recognize you're Israel, but you're going to come through us because now we say yeah. who's ruling and who's who. It's still white supremacy, you know. Maybe we can't yeah. have the whole pie, but we got to take the biggest piece in, in our minds. What's the biggest piece, you know? And so I wanted, yeah. I wanted to kind of put that out there. And then the other thing I wanted to say is, like, I, I'm really coming to understand the need for group economics, and I think that it's yeah. easy to get discouraged. Yeah. Easy to get discouraged when we look around at other Hebrews and how you know we can we conduct ourselves in the community, and it's really difficult to try to do business sometimes within our community or to try and support within our community because we're dealing with so much post-traumatic slave syndrome, so much mental illness and instability, mental instability and things like that. So we got to work out. we got to work out. It's like hard to, hard to come together and be cooperative and collaborative if we're still uh, so broken over, you know, being rejected by this society that we can't even appreciate each other or accept each other. Mm, so, yes. so, so, so that's my part is, is I'm trying to help do that work in the community. However, the financial aspect, the group part, 
I'm thinking if we can just do little things that can mean big things. For example, on a family level, my husband and I own our home. You know, we have adult children. We still have uh, three younger that are in the household. But we have adult children, and we have a daughter that's getting married. So we're like, hey, let's build a room until this home live here, and let's put our money together, and we can do mm-hmm. something. We can buy something. We can create something. We can, you know. And if so if we can start to raise our children with the idea that you're an asset to this family, and together as yeah. a family we're going to do something, and our money is going to pool together, and you, you don't have to jump up and run out of here when you're 18 and leave. You you stay here with us and build. Mm. You know, it's a it's a real it's a paradigm shift. But yeah. it, it needs to happen. I know my mother. You know, when I turned eighteen, she my birthday gift was a suitcase. Bye. You know, <laughs> and, um, and we have to stop doing that. We have to stop doing that as a as a people. We have to start investing in our children past the age of eighteen you know, trying to teach them to, to stay with us and to build with us and to, if, if, we all put, if we're all putting our money into one household, then there's more money for us to invest in creating these documentaries or sending money to Africa or building our own schools or whatever the things are that we desire to do, even if it's just, you know, being all in the same place. But if we got to bounce up out of here, we're all in the same place. You know what I mean? So. Right. Mm-hmm. Those are just some thoughts that I had as I was listening to you all. And again, I just want to say thank you for all that you're sharing. I'm completely motivated and inspired to learn more. So I'm definitely going to be hitting up everybody's web and um, and buying books and stuff. So thank you very much. And um, with that, I'll I'll say good night. Thank you, sister. Good night. Uh, only love, are you there? Well, shalom. Sorry, I was talking. I just want to say thank you, Sister Angela. And um, Angela is um, a part of Under the Palm, Hebrew Women Speak, which is hosted by Mayana Johnson and um, something that um, Mayana and Sal conceived. So thank you for um, making those excellent points. And many teachers now are saying, you know, the 10 tribes are black, the Judah and Levi are still um, you know, are still white or something like that. Even at Eddie Bishop, Eddie Long's church, a rabbi came and preached that. But you have to be mm. mindful of the little half-truths and half-lies where it's like, I've also heard, well, Levi's black. But then Levi never um, had a portion of the land because they were to be spread out. So someone giving mm-hmm. us this Levi means we still don't own the land of Israel. So we have to be really wise. But any brothers want to respond to either comment that Sister Angela made before we take um, the last call? Um, I Uh, mean, well, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. You can go. Yeah. I was just going to say I agree. Um, I think that's part of their um, plan. It just seems like that's where they're going. Because uh, I know um, some of the guys, like the, the videos I've seen with some of the rabbis that try to go to West Africa, that they're on this mission to declare. Um, and even um, Harry Rosenberg, one of his videos, he talks about how um, the people that's that's most West Africans. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but are supposed to be from the ten tribes, and they and they supposedly they're supposed to be um, the Yahudim, you know, with the ten tribes. Um, they they trying to figure out a way to fit themselves into the store some kind of way and um and if they'll if we allow them that's what they're gonna try to do now we know that the Most High ain't gonna stand for that um because the scripture tell us when we 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 read the book and we see it in the book when he said he's gonna make the synagogue of Satan um you know um recognize who we are so um but again and I just want to back up on something else too this ties into that. Um, when we talking about the influence of, of um, the Ashkenazis and the, so, and the so-called Sephardics, we see this whole tie of, of our people being disassociated with with Africa and with Africans, um, quote unquote, you know, so-called Negroes, so-called Africans, which you know we we, we African people, but in the connotation of what they try to say, um, right. with this whole concept of what we see is um, proclaimed in some of the camps, 
because we talked about earlier, the whole people putting up memes, and that's that they have a really dark person, and they have a light skinned person. They'd be like, "Am I?" Yep. Um, it's yes. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's that yep. Dark, like that. Oh my god. So, <laughs> so, so all that stuff it comes from Ashkenazi influence. Some of the same mm-hmm. people doing this. They wear they wearing the Star of David. They they keeping some of the um, Talmudic um, teachings. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, some of the stuff that we brought out in the first documentary. I I just you know I went through and, and exposed all that stuff because people was um, some of the camps, um, some of their philosophies. Which it, when you hear it, it looks like this. This is how the world works. A black person says it. Oh man, I can't believe they said that. Say that. A Jewish person said it. Oh, it's part of their religion, and that's pretty much how it goes. When you hear GMS mm-hmm. say, say stuff they say about twelve year old go- girls, which is horrendous, um, mm. your mind you want to gag. But then when um, when you point out the same people, the same people that follow the Jewish people, that, that's in the Talmud, and even worse things when you talk about how um, in the Talmud it talks about how um, a rabbi can have sex. Um, with a six-year-old boy, and it's um, and it's not a sin. How um, they can have sex with um, a newborn baby girl, and it's not considered to be rape. Um, it's all of a sudden in a different um, um tone because it's the Jew, it's the white Jewish people versus these brothers on on the street corner. But again, the tie of both things is that Talmudic doctrine and the influence of the Ashkenazi. So what do you don't see these brothers on the on the street screaming at? Ashkenazi. <laughs> you see it every now and then. You see us talking about the, the Jewish people, but most of the time they, they're yelling at, um, uh, you know, um, white Europeans in America. They're getting on um, the, the Hamites. See all these videos where they're cussing at, um, at African people and um, talking about how, um, you know, but, but then they pull up this tribe chart of the, the Hispanics and talking about how the Hispanics are the actual um, children of Israel, going back to about the colorism and all this, these type things. But all that influence came from the Ashkenazi Jews. So, um, mm-hmm. so I think the two things are tied. This whole influence of them and them trying to um, make a spot for themselves in, in our culture, um, and they're, they're hijacking um, of um, of this awakening. And so we got to be real conscious of that. Thank you so much. And um, we have to use wisdom because people are very crafty, and we even have to be wise about um, how we're going about spreading this information. Sadly. The majority of the people who have been called Hamites are actually our brothers. And um, Mm -hmm. we really have to stop following fables and test everything. And so with that, thank you, brothers, for going over time. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, all the listeners. We just wanted to have everyone go around and just make one um, quick closing statement. And please give your name your ministry name, any websites, blogs, YouTubes, where people can find your work and build with you. All of these brothers are humble, personable, um, and are doing great work. So we'll start with Brother Yahoo, um, just giving your, your contact info, and Big Brother's books as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, my contact info is, um, well, on YouTube, I, I go by the name Evel Gamesu. So, um, again, I said that. The uh, characters won't really be found, you know, on the text, so you would have probably type in Gamesu, and then you could find me that way. And um, I'm mostly uh, situated with uh, Evzed.org, the, the website that I mentioned also earlier. I don't have any uh, social media uh, platforms yet, but um, I will in the future. And um, as for, you know, closing statement, um, I think us brothers should continue to uh, edify our people and continue to bring out this truth because, um, you know, our people really need it. There's still so many of us that, that don't, uh, so many of our people that don't know this truth and, you know, they still subscribe to the, the whole Jewish claim. And so, you know, if we could have more and more people coming to the truth, that would be a good thing. And also, uh, last, um, our children are also very important. Why I say our children? Because it's not, we don't know if we will, this generation get back to the promised land but even if we don't get back we have set the foundation for the children so they won't forget what we did yes so you know when even if we don't make it and the children the next generation are to come into the land they'll already have the foundation because brothers like you already put it down and laid it out for them and gave them the identity so they could remember who they were and who they came from and uh that, that is all Thank you so much. And um, Brother Ron, any any closing statements you have? 
Oh, uh, well, yeah, they can, people, um, they can, I got four books. They can, uh, everything I have is on, including the podcast show, uh, replays, archives are on my website, www.thenegronetwork.com. And, um, uh, 2018, this this year is going to be a big year. Uh, we got uh, not just the collaboration movie, uh, Hebrew Sunitas Reclaiming the Throne, with, with uh, me, myself, and uh, uh, Hebrew Nation Building and the other uh, groups, people we named off earlier, but uh, also my solo movie project that I started a year ago, Hebrews to Negroes, uh, Wake Up Black America, the movie is coming out as well, so it's, it's going to be time out. <laughs> it's going to be an end to all this lying and, and deception. Mm-hmm. Um, people are going to be waking up. Uh, and like I always say, my motto is a lie cannot live forever. And we got to show this truth. we got to be the, the front runners of this because we're up against a juggernaut of, of people that's, orchest- you know, it's just basically crafty council confederate that's trying to keep us asleep. And, you know, if we don't do it, then our, the generation of, of kids uh, coming up, uh, they're not going to know this truth. And people are already trying to count out generations of uh, African-Americans because of a lot of the things yeah. they see going on in society. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's important yep. that we try to set our mark and, and wake up as many people as possible, uh, despite in spite of all the, the entertainment, the Super Bowl, Black Panther, you know, reality shows, TV shows, all that stuff is just keeping us distracted and, and, and different types of genres of rap music. So, um, you know, I mean, it's my Negro Network platform is basically to um, help aid in, in waking up uh, Jacob and children of Israel. Thank you, Brother Ron. And Brother Ron has a weekly podcast, um, 8.30 mm-hmm. p.m. Um, Eastern on Wednesdays, and he has multiple books. I can't keep track of all the books this brother has. <laughs> so go on his website to see. Um, and um, Brother Jarrell, you want to say um, your closing statement and just get where the people can build with you? Yes. Um, they can build with me on Facebook. Um, I'm at um, Facebook, Akian Didisu, under the name Akian Didisu. And um, I'm also connected to ever.org. Um, and my closing statement is never be afraid to build and uplift your people. Um, as we yeah. see um, a lot of things going on pertaining to our people and um, the oppression and the self-hatred, um, never be afraid to show courage and uplift your people and, and tell them their truth. That's it. Mm-hmm. Thank yeah. you, brother, and thank you for all of the support you've given my research. And um Yes. Brother Josh, you want to close us out with your closing statement Uh-oh. and contact info? Yeah. Um, um, I just want to thank everybody for uh, being on this call. I, I learned a lot from everybody on this call. Um, uh, just, just great um, dialogue about what we need to do. And um, we, and this whole concept of us reaching out to and um, proving the ancestry of our, our brothers that are still in um, the motherland is going to be a, yeah. a key element of that. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. If you, um, and again, um, the project to my source, uh, me and um, uh, Hebrew Wikipedia, a.k.a. Ron Dalton, um, <laughs> working on <laughs> right now, it's just, uh, uh, Hebrews and Negroes are claiming the throne, and uh, our sister, our love Chica, who um, so graciously moderated um uh, this call is in, in the documentary and countless others. Um, you know, and if I if I start naming names, I'm gonna forget one like I did at the beginning, so I'm not gonna do it. Um, <laughs> but if you want to donate to that project, um, again, it's um, GoFundMe uh, slash Reclaiming the Throne. Um, please go donate, and, it, and also remember, like just like we talked about earlier about global funds and Russia. So um, we want. We, we hoping that it's something that we can do, and we um, within our people, and not we don't want to go to any other groups because there's people who don't want this information. And, and not, not only this movie, but the movies that on the projects that everyone that's on this call, future products projects that any of our people putting out, that's putting out this information to stop. Me and Run it actually had an issue, even with GoFundMe, of them blocking our donations. So for for a while, people was giving donations to GoFundMe, wow. GoFundMe or and they were blocking. Wow. And, you would attest to that, right? <laughs> so, um, 
So anyway, um, that was so we finally got that straightened out because um, that was a problem. So there, there's definitely a, um, a a move to try to suppress this information that everybody is sharing on this call. So um, with that, you know, like I say, um, me and um, Boris Williams, um, my op, that we work on playing this ministry. The ministry is called the Birth of a Nation, um, Hebrew Kingdom Building or Hebrew Nation Building. If you want to get find any kind of information, you can go to um, I think Rebirth of a Nation dot um, info is the website. But we don't do a lot of stuff on the website. Um, if you want to catch us on Facebook, um, the same it's the long title Rebirth of a Nation Hebrew Kingdom Building, <laughs> Hebrew Nation Building on Facebook. Or if you want to follow us on YouTube, all the all the um, services that we have, we simulcast them on um, on YouTube and um, and on um, in our Facebook group. So if you go to YouTube, it's going um, Hebrew Nation Building. You can find us there. And um, again, like I said, I'm going to uh, say shalom and uh, appreciate everybody on this call. Yeah, thank shalom, you. Man. And thank, I want to thank shalom. all the panelists for joining me. Um, many of you are, um, you know, some of you are people who I've known for a while. Some of you I'm just getting to know, but I admire the work of all of you. Um, I definitely appreciate Sal for, um, you know, hearing a sister out when I said, you know, all the brothers speaking about African Hebrews, where the sister's at. And so I really appreciate you, Sal, for the platform and for everything that you do. Debate Talk for You has shows all throughout the week. I've been a longtime listener from season one, and Sal is the producer, the mastermind. They have a segment, Man Up where Hebrew men are speaking about their reality under the palm, mm. various debates. And Sal gives um, many people with different beliefs a respectable platform, even if those are not his beliefs. Um, and so I want to thank you, Sal, and I want to encourage everyone to donate to Debate Talk for You. This is a black, yes. you know, owned radio show podcast where we can come and discuss the truth, we can go into overtime, but all of that costs resources. And so if it's on yeah. your heart, mm-hmm. donate to Debate Talk for you. And um, for me, my this is Only Love Chica Alston, and I'm the founder of propheticworldwind.com. I'm not Prophetic Whirlwind. Um, I, I do not call myself a prophetess, but the prophetic world went from, y- y'all know, some of y'all know where that came from, just, you know, but um, that prophetic world went yeah. comes from the Honorable Marcus Garvey, who had many Hebrews helping him, who in his speech, meet me in the whirlwind. And if you look in the Bible, the whirlwind is there, is basically the, the, the breath and the dry bones that's going to raise up the children of Israel, it's the Ruach. The, the what people call the Holy Spirit. And so I would suggest listening to Meet Me in the World when because Marcus Garvey is dropping a lot of knowledge about who we are, and Hebrews helped him design the Constitution for the UNIA, design the, um, the hymn for the UNIA. They even had a gathering about the religion that black people should follow when they were seriously considering the Hebrew Faith. And so it's sad when Hebrews don't want to be Pan-African, not knowing how much their mm-hmm. forefathers helped orchestrate the movement. And so you can yeah. find me at yeah. propheticworldwind.com. That's my website. I'm also on Facebook, YouTube, um, and, and Instagram. And um, I wanted to, it's, um, in March for so-called Women's History Month, I'm doing an ancient Hebraic woman's Study online, and if the ladies want to join that, they can email info at propheticworldwind.com to get the materials, and that's going to be really looking at our matriarchs and our archetypes, um, because many, I learned from an African Hebrew sister that when the people migrated, it was actually the women that would give the call that it was time to migrate, so that's a lost part of our Hebrew history, and women can join that. Brothers, sorry, it's just for the ladies. And um, on Monday, <laughs> February 12th at 8 p.m., Under the Palm, Hebrew Women Speak with myself, Angela, Mayana Johnson, Shanti, Amuna Israel. We will be on with the Imams. We always have the elders with us. We'll be on talking about social media. So through social media, I've been able to connect with so many, many um, African Hebrew family members, but there's also a downside to social media. And, um, you know, social media can be a blessing or a curse. So the ladies are going to be talking about that. 
And just in closing, I would just encourage everyone um, to not be deceived, to not be deceived by our own people teaching falsehoods, to not be deceived by those outside of our community seeking to take our identity, but to remember Yah's word will always come to pass. If our people who are called, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, mm-hmm. I will hear and heal the land. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. Isaiah 11, Yah's word will never go out void. And Africans on the continent and Africans in the diaspora, we've both done mm-hmm. each other wrong because we first did Yah wrong. And so we have to heal, we have to bring those two sticks together, but we have to do it with the power of Yaz Ruach. And so with that, um, we want to say good night, but I wanted to ask one of the brothers, if you can close in prayer and especially pray for our Hebrew brothers and sisters in Africa, because, you know, without Yah, we wouldn't be able to do anything. So is there anyone who feels led to close this wonderful time out with a prayer? I'll, I'll do it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for your goodness and mercy and love and kindness. Thank you for bringing yes, yes. brothers and sisters together to do your will and your work, knowing that we're in a time that's, that's extremely dangerous. We're in a time of Jacob's trouble, yeah. There are, there are enemies that have to crack yes, the yeah. council, destroy us as a people, and then to cut us off, yeah. We know that there's no power that's on that can, yes, heaven yeah. and earth. Past you, you have all power. So we seeking you. We are not seeking ourselves. We can do nothing of ourselves, but in you we can do all things. So we ask you that we do all things that might please you and that might do the work to bring your people together. Yeah, that you might call your people yes, that scattered yeah. to the four winds, people that's meted and that's trodden down, the people that's that, that's dying, the people that's desolate. Yes, that you yeah. might rise up those dry bones. That we might prophesy. That you might prophesy. That you might breathe mm. your your life upon us. That we might come together, bone to bone. Yes, yeah. Seed. Yes. To be a great army yes. and to overtake the and walk in the blessing that you prophesied to our forefathers yes, yeah. that we might walk and we everything that's in our hand. So yeah, we ask you again that, that anybody, not only the people that's that's within the hearing of our voice, but yeah, everyone that you that you call yes, out, everyone yeah. that you see, yeah. That everybody everybody that's, that's in your mind that you would just reach them, that you would awaken them, that we might wake up from this slumber, and that we might do your will. We love you. We praise you. In the name of your son, Yahushua Hamashit. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sal. Good night, everyone.